Hello, my dear friend, and thank you for tuning in to today's video. Before I get into the topic, which is about self-trust and creativity and confidence, uh, qualities that are extremely important to me that I, I really strive to embody and express, um, but that don't always come easily, you know, despite what what it what it might seem to be based on the fact that I make these long videos where I share my life experiences and my beliefs and my feelings, um, that's something that I've really worked towards. It's not something that came naturally or instantly. Um, but anyhow, before I get into that topic, I am so excited to share with you some postcard prints that I just got back from the printers today. Um, if you're one of my regular viewers, you already know this, that I've been working towards illustrations for a new coloring book, an abstract art coloring book, um, to be the third in my Color Your Way to Creative Consciousness series. And unlike my first two coloring books, I'm aiming towards making the, the pages in this one obviously much more detailed. Let's see how close I can get that to the camera before it's blurry. Um, but yeah, my goal in this one is to kind of assume the best about the people coloring it rather than create the images based on what I think would be easy to color like I've done in the past. Um, but this time I'm looking to really fill the pages and make something that I would want to color in and which I do want to color in because I plan to add watercolor paint to a lot of these. Um, but anyway, yeah, I had these printed by a company where you can submit your files and print it online um, because of course, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the actual physical print shop is closed. Uh, but I was eager to test out a few of these anyway. So I ordered um, six black and white prints and one color print just to test the quality. Um, so these are available in my Etsy shop now for $2.22, $2.22 each. Um, I chose the price based on sacred numbers, the repeat numbers that, you know, call it superstition if you will, but to me, um, to this day, whenever I see a repeat number, I feel like it's a little sign from whoever might be sending a sign. I don't want to say the universe because, you know, the universe to me is space and void and stars and planets and infinity, but, you know, some people would call it the universe or source or spirit guides. Um, I'm agnostic to the point that I don't know what it is or who it is or what to call it. Uh, but I'm still whimsical enough that I believe there is uh, a higher intelligence or at least an invisible intelligence that communicates with us in life. So anyway, yeah, they're $2.22 each. Um, but if you buy the full pack of six black and white drawings, uh, you save a bit of money. They become $12.21, a palindrome, which to me is just as auspicious as a repeat number. I was really hoping that by choosing a matte finish rather than a glossy finish, uh, these would be basically like postcards that you can color. Um, but unfortunately, even though it's a matte finish, I, I hope you can see this on camera, maybe not, but even though it's a matte finish, there's still a bit of a sheen to it. So sadly, um, pencil crayons and, you know, pencil crayons and watercolor paint won't work on these, but you could use, of course, a gel pen to color them in. You could use felt tip markers or felts of any kind. Uh, you could use fine liners for sure to, to achieve some interesting coloring results. So if you're a coloring book enthusiast, uh, no go on the pencil crayons for these babies, but if you've got gel pens or felt tips or markers, uh, even highlighters, they would definitely work. I would just say be careful between 
uh, between colors and between applications because the color will not soak into the cardstock. It'll just kind of sit on top, which means it would take a while to dry. Um, I'm thinking, let me know in the comments if you think I should do this or not. I'm, I'm, I'm debating. But see, I've left all of these blank on the back. And the back is that perfect matte paper texture for, you know, pencil crayons or watercolor paint or other wet mediums. What I'm thinking is if I order more of these in the future, uh, either to, to create like a loose leaf coloring book folio, like an unbound collection of coloring pages, um, or to sell specifically for people to color, what I'm thinking is I will leave the front of the postcard blank and have the print image on the back so it can be fully colored in. Um, or you know what, I'll just wait until businesses open again and that the lockdown comes to a close and I'll probably go to a, a local print shop in person and just choose a paper, more like a multimedia or watercolor paper. I don't know, let, let me know. If, if you were to buy something like that, would you want to color it in or would you just keep it as the black and white illustration art? Because um, I, I kind of, I mean, I'm biased because I drew them, but I kind of like them just as black and white prints. Um, I don't know if color would enhance them or detract from them or complement them. I don't know. I'm undecided. But anyway, the, the full color one is glossy finish, and I think this turned out so beautifully. I will probably get more, um, more full color postcards when, like I said, when some of these start to sell, then I can reinvest that money into getting more. It is freaking expensive to have your art printed. Like now I know why art prints on Etsy cost so much and why people charge so much money, excuse me, so much money for postcards. Um, it's not because they're greedy, it's because it is, I want to say bloody expensive, I don't usually use that word, but it is expensive as heck to have your art printed. Um, of course, if you order like 500 copies, they, they become something like, you know, 25 cents to 50 cents each, but then you still have to pay like a couple hundred bucks, which, let's be honest, those of us who have micro businesses on Etsy, we can't afford to have 500 of each thing printed. But anyway, I, I will probably get more of my paintings done in color prints. And I've left them all completely blank on the back because um, if they had the line down the middle and the mark for where to put uh, a stamp and the line for where to put the address, then they are less fun to work with for people who do mail art. And if you don't know what mail art is, if you are artsy or crafty, like I, like I consider myself to be, or like I'd like to think I am, uh, if you don't know what mail art is, just Google it as soon as you're done listening to my video, uh, because it is so much fun. Um, people who are, you know, into snail mail and letter writing and kind of the lost art of calligraphy and handwriting and paper collecting and stamp collecting and postcard collecting. I mean, I'm gonna start lifting here because my nerd thigh is gonna come out, but like, if you're into that kind of nerdy paper stuff, I'm sorry, that's cringy, that's annoying even to me. But if, if you're into that kind of stuff, like calligraphy and handwriting and stickers and stamps, um, I, I've never spoken about this on my YouTube channel before, but I've been into this thing called post crossing off and on for like 12 years now. I think I started back in 2008 when I worked at DKNY um, because my job was so stressful and it, it was just such a, such a drudgery going into this high pressure, um, sales oriented, non-vegetarian work environment. Like, dude, I was a vegan and I had to sell leather shoes just to pay my rent. Like that was not fun at all for me. Um, so to kind of 
give me something to look forward to at the end of every difficult work day. I joined this site that is called Post Crossing, which, you know, at first I thought it would be kind of a scam because I, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place in this in this little talk, but hear me out. I, I think it'll be worth it if you like this kind of stuff. Um, I thought it was going to be a scam at first because when I was in elementary school, like so many other people in elementary school, I would regularly get these chain letters from my friends and they said things like, um, send 10 postcards to the top 10 addresses here or something bad will happen to you, you know? you. It, it was kind of like, I think this is where movies like The Grudge got their idea from, or The Ring, where like you'll be cursed if you don't answer this stupid chain letter. Um, and because I was always a bit superstitious, I always did it. And it would say, like, if you send 10 postcards to the top 10 addresses, you will receive 10 postcards back from 10 people who in the future get these chain letters. I mean, whoever invented chain letters and started circulating them amongst, like, kids in grade three, um, that's hor- like, you're a bad person, whoever started this trend, because it's basically like a pyramid scheme for kids, and of course, who pays for the postage on the replies to all of these stupid, like, pointless chain letters? It's the parents. like. After this video, I'm going to send my mom a little apology note and say, sorry I made you always uh, help me reply to those chain letters. But long story short, I always followed the instructions on those chain letters and never got anything back. So years later, when I heard about something called post crossing, and I'll, I'll put the link to it in the video description, this is not only not sponsored, but like they don't even know I'm talking about this in a video. I, I don't think they even do sponsor anybody because it's a non-profit thing. But Post Crossing is this um, website where you create a profile kind of like other social media and you tell as much or as little about yourself as you want to, but you, you enter your address. Um, and your general interests, and you can put a picture if you want. And then if you, if you want to get postcards back from people around the world, you select to, to send postcards first. And it starts, I think, with five. Um, so basically, you, you click a button, and it gives you an auto-generated random address for somebody in the world and you see their profile, you see their address, and their likes and dislikes, you learn a little bit about them, and then you just send them a postcard. And you have to put a little code that shows that the postcard was sent by you, so that when the recipient gets it, they enter that code, and once that code is registered by that person, your address gets given as the auto-generated address to somebody else somewhere in the world who sends you a postcard. So I tried it out with, um, I wouldn't say anticipation, I would say I tried this out with uh, kind of expecting the worst. I thought, worst case scenario, I'll send five random people postcards, make them a little happy, and I probably won't get anything back. But within like a couple of weeks, I got five postcards back from all over the world. I think my first five were from like Finland and China and Russia. And like I said, somebody like me who's into paper and interested in world cultures and, you know, loves stamps. I totally get nerdy people who are stamp collectors because it's a little miniature piece of artwork used as a currency that can take a letter or a picture from one place in the world and, and you can send it wherever you want just using that tiny little picture that represents the country from which it comes. To me, that's just cool. You know, maybe I am a nerd. I like Star Trek. I like stamp collecting. I like uh, crystals and gemstones like Sumi. I mean, if you're listening to this, you, you probably get it. You're probably 
either into that stuff too, or at least you can understand why somebody would be. So anyway, I, I, I stopped doing post crossing maybe like three or four years ago when I moved to India into that organization that turned out to be a cult. Um, because obviously people in that kind of a stressful, um, oppressive, environment where where every minute of your day is micromanaged like there's no time to do fun stuff like post crossing so i got back into it a couple of weeks ago i reactivated my profile entered my new p.o box address sent out a few postcards i haven't gotten any back yet but it was very recent um, but what i noticed when i went through people's profiles is that instead of just putting a stamp and an address and a message, like standard postcard stuff, people are getting super creative. Um, have you guys heard of washi tape? Spelled W-A-S-H-I, uh, like washi paper, like the Japanese origami paper, because um, I had never heard of it before. But there's this major fad going around in the post-crossing community and the snail mail community um, and it is washi tape. And so instead of just writing a postcard, people are creating these really beautiful collages using washi printed tape and magazine clippings and, and, you know, vintage paper cutouts and stickers and stuff. And it is just so cool. So after seeing those, I thought maybe I'll leave these postcards blank on the back. So if somebody is into mail art and wants to say for example write the address huge and paint around it or draw around it and put like you know fancy stamps they're not limited by the postcard format like you can put a bunch of lower denomination stamps across half of it and write the address you can you can have fun with it and because that's the kind of thing i have fun with i just assume other people do too so I've pulled back up the drawing I made in my last video because it will be relevant. But before that, I've got one more nerdy little thing to show you. And that is that I had business cards printed for my art. And the back side is the proper kind of mat so somebody could color a bit on here. Oops, had it upside down. Um, but yeah, it basically just says creative consciousness because that's the working title I've given to all my abstract art and my name and I did one of the black and white illustrations on one side and my all-time favorite watercolor painting on the front uh, because I feel happy whenever I see this painting. If you saw my video where I do um, where I do kind of a flip through of all the watercolor paintings I had in my in my painting box. You would have seen this one already. Um, and yeah, it, it's just my, my absolute favorite. The title I gave to this little piece was Silence Speaks the Depth of Still Water, Where Manifestation Requires No Action. And my feeling behind that is that when you are in the space of silence, um, you know, you're not frantically worried about something, and you're not too uh, driven by, you know, the greed for a result when you're just doing something in that space of silence, because in the moment, that's what you feel to do. Whatever result you would have wanted just happens. Whereas if, if you're working and you are result oriented and say, just as an example, like my, my jewelry shop on Etsy, I started that jewelry shop uh, in 2014 when I found a box of old crystal and gemstone beads that I'd collected um, back when I lived in Vancouver. I used to just hoard gemstones and beads and crystals and stuff because I loved them. So one day in 2014, I came across my old gemstone bead collection and thought, you know, I've hoarded these, but I've done nothing with them. And maybe it's time to pass them into the world if somebody else wants them. So I made some bracelets and I, I just made them based on what I would like to wear. 
So I kind of designed jewelry that I loved and listed them on Etsy kind of on a whim. I wasn't expecting, you know, I, I wasn't making them because I, I was desperate to get sales. Um, at that time, back in those days, before Adblock was invented, a person could make a little bit of money doing YouTube videos, which sadly we cannot anymore. Um, making YouTube videos barely pays for itself in, in 2020, but back in 2014, it was kind of like making YouTube videos could be my full-time job. So I created that Etsy shop, kind of like as a, as a for fun hobby, but to my surprise and delight and I'm grateful to this day for, for this happening, uh, within a couple of days, every bracelet I had made sold. And that's what I mean when I say that if you're in the space of silence and creativity, manifestation requires no, it, it requires no worry and no stress. Like a lot of people think if, if they're not goal oriented and they don't, they don't stress out about the result of their actions, that they'll never achieve anything. Um, but in my experience, if, if I've ever made a piece of jewelry to sell it based on what's trending online. You know, et Etsy shop owners, we get these little messages from Etsy once in a while saying like, you know, make the most of spring. Shoppers are searching for this style more than any other. And it's usually that really basic looking like initial pendants or, um, you know, stuff like that. I, d I don't want to shit talk anybody's taste. So I'm sorry I said basic, but but for but I guess standard. It's very common looking stuff. It, it's like what you'd see at Claire's Accessories, but um, handmade on Etsy instead of mass produced in a factory. So there have been times I'm I'm kind of ashamed to admit, but there have been times in my creative journey where sales have been low and money has been tight and desperate times call for desperate measures. So there have been times when I've tried to make styles that I thought would cater to a wider audience, you know, more, you know, they're more consumer friendly for the average person. And those pieces never sell. The, the listing expires, I usually choose not to renew it. And then I go back to making the things that I love that make me happy. And those are the pieces that sell. And so whatever you're doing in life, I feel like if you're authentic to yourself and you're expressing your personal passion, that is the manifestation that requires no action. And of course, it doesn't mean sit there on your ass and, you know, eat some sugary sweets and wait for the universe to shower gold coins on you because that's not how Lakshmi works. That's not how manifestation works. Uh, you do have to take actions, but in the direction of your joy and your excitement, uh, not in the direction of what a business school graduate might tell you is the right thing to do. So I guess maybe if I were to retitle that painting, it would be more like uh, manifestation requires no stress because you do still have to make the stuff and upload it in order for other people to see it. Um, you do need to make a video in order for other people to hear your messages on YouTube. You can't just sit there, feel in a certain way, and suddenly people pick up on that wavelength. Um, we haven't evolved into a purely telepathic society yet, so in the meantime, stuff like this will still be necessary for communication. Um, anyhow, my very last show and tell piece for this video, I got new business cards. And for the very first time, I am pretty darn proud of myself for this design. I chose uh, one of the photos I took of my, my. let's be honest, it is my favorite piece in my shop right now. Um, it's part of a collection I've made using a vegan polymer clay that has actual mineral particles in it. It's, it's filled with micro particles of mica so the gold look is actual mineralogically golden. It's not just a fake acrylic gold paint or something. 
and I've sculpted these little rock gardens out of it. See how these tiny little clay rocks come to a point? Um, each one is a different shape. You can see my thumbprint or my fingerprint in some of them because each one was handmade. Um, there are ways to eliminate that that I read about online that I did not know when I first made this. But I would kind of consider that to be a happy accident because you can tell it's handmade because my fingerprint is there. But anyway, I made these rock gardens inspired by various sacred earthworks around the world. Um, so for example, if you go to Great Britain, there are places where ancient rock piles have become covered with topsoil and grass grows on them now, but you can tell there's like a man-made mound or a pyramid under that. And they used to call those fairy mounds and local legends would say that kind of playful sprites would frequent the area. And of course, nowadays we have our own modern mythology in those places because they usually have a crap load of crop circles forming around them and people have all kinds of you know, UFO sightings and other visionary mystic experiences. Um, and of course that's not limited to Great Britain. Here in Alberta, Canada, where I live, a lot of First Nations people have created rings of rocks and, you know, archaeologists and, um, you know, people who study the culture the opinion kind of varies based on whether these were teepee rings, like whether these rocks were used to hold down the, the temporary tent villages that these nomads erected, because they didn't stay in one place. They were a, a migratory people. They would kind of move with the seasons, following their food source and following um, nature. So a lot of people think these stone rings were, you know, part of their shelter. But other people say that these stone rings were created kind of the way a pagan person, like somebody who f practices um, Wicca or, or other spirit casting, you know, rituals, would cast a circle in order to perform a mystical rite. There's one place I, I am eager to get there. Um, but it's on reserve land, so because I don't have any First Nations ancestry, I don't think I can go there. It would be like trespassing. Um, but my auntie, my auntie Mary Lynn got to see it. Do you, do you say auntie or auntie? I always said auntie. But in India, people made fun of me for saying aunt and auntie because to them, that pronunciation of the word makes them think of insects like an ant. And so whenever I would say, oh yeah, my Aunt Mary Lynn told me this, 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 they'd kind of look at me cross-eyed like I was crazy. And then they'd realize that I don't actually have a talking pet insect that I've named Mary Lynn. Like, it's my aunt. So do you, do you say aunt or aunt? It feels unnatural for me to say aunt, but I kind of got in the habit. Okay, here, here's my babbling again. I get so sidetracked and diverted in these videos, but... Thank you to those who commented that you like it when I get sidetracked and rambly because that makes me feel so much better about my natural communication tendencies. But anyhow, my, my Aunt Mary Lynn, she's a retired school teacher, but back when she still taught, she would take her class on a field trip to this place. And local, local elders and local native guides would, would take them on this hike up a hill that they called the Weatherman's Hill. And I think it was Blackfoot, the Blackfoot people. There, there are lots of different bands of First Nations here in Alberta. Um, so it could have been Pagan, it could have been, you know, the Blood people. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll try to find out. If any of you are interested in this, let me know in the comments and I will ask my aunt and see if I can get a clearer uh, name of which peoples these were. But on their reserve, they have this one hill that to them is a sacred site. And they say that a, a few hundred years ago, a, a man who I would describe with modern terminology as an enlightened man, 
who was born into their community, and he could control the weather. So if they needed rain, for example, because the grounds were parched, he would conduct a certain ceremony and it would rain. Or if it was, you know, too rainy and they needed the sun, he would do something and bring the sun. And to this day, his gravesite on that hill is venerated by, um, by that tribe. And my auntie said she, she, she's not really into new agey stuff or mystical stuff. She's kind of, I don't know if I'd call her atheist. You know what? I shouldn't even talk about her personal beliefs because I didn't ask her permission to bring her up in my videos, but I, she's pretty cool. I think she'd be cool with it. But she, she's not the kind of person like me who believes in crystal healing and who believes that crop circles are a genuine phenomena. I don't think it's people with boards stopping, stomping down those crops because, guys, I have been inside crop circles when I was in England and you can't stomp on a board and create a perfect geometric symbol in the wheat where like I, my friends and I kind of examined the bottoms of these crop circles and they weren't just flattened. They were, they were bent and woven in some places. If you've ever woven reeds into a wicker basket or if you've ever woven grasses, it's pretty hard to do because they don't cooperate. They're, they're, they grow straight in nature. They don't grow in a basket weave pattern. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm 100% sure it's aliens, but I am 100% sure it's not people stomping on the ground with boards. It's something. Anyway, um, yeah, so I'm inspired by ancient earthworks. Back to the subject. Why am I holding this business card still? It's because when, you know, the First Nations people here in Canada would pile stones, they would signify sacred spaces. And so, I mean, in the north, if you see the Anukshuk where stones are piled up in the shape of that little friendly character who greets you, or um, wherever you go, megaliths and megalithic structures of stones always represent the interaction between people who are still living with nature and nature to create something of a, a harmonized co-creation. And so I made all of these pieces with little miniature stones that I piled up around crystals as my way of co-creating something with nature. And so this, this piece is my favorite because I love how the little golden gems, sorry, little golden stones on one side go up onto the ring and on the other side, the ring comes out kind of halfway through the base and I've built up this little mound. So anyway, one side of my po my business card shows this, and the other side shows my other favorite necklace, which includes a Lemurian seed crystal, and some watermelon tourmaline, and pink tourmaline, and Herkimer diamonds, and peridot, like it's all kinds of good stuff. So I got super excited when I got these business cards back. Um, I'm a pretty thrifty girl. I hardly ever spend money on myself. So something like this, even though it's something I'm going to give away to people with their orders or, you know, give to my mom's friends, give to my friends, send it with my snail mail letters to my pen pals and stuff. Even though it's not really for me, technically, it's, it's such a treat. And especially because I design my own business cards, as a thrifty person, I never hire a graphic designer or, you know, pay the extra fee for somebody else to format it for me. I just upload my own images. Um, but I really like the way the, the pink color I chose for the name and for the words matches the pink and the watermelon tourmaline without being overwhelming. And because it's springtime when I made these, I love that it's got that springtime vibe. And here's my failed attempt. This was my last business card. I kinda, I don't know what I was thinking. It's, it's embarrassing now that I see what, it, what I'm capable of creating. But I kind of just like piled 
all of my jewelry into a big mass and took the picture and left white space where I could put the words, thinking more is more. But when I see a design that has just one piece of jewelry that kind of stands out, now I understand less is more. So I've got to get rid of all of these. I'm, I'm thinking with my upcoming orders, I'll include like three of these. People can use them as like, um, what I use them for, I sometimes keep my own business cards and use them as bookmarks. So I mean, I'll get rid of these, but also start sending the beautiful ones. All right, so 35 minutes of an introduction and we're finally going to get to the topic of this video. And it's, it's based on a comment that I received on my last video. So ever in the rising, if you're watching and listening to this, thank you so much for your comment. I, I really love it. Um, I read every word and I'm not going to read every word in this video because some of it might be personal. I'll, I'll get to where you're asking a question. Um, but just thank you so much for that beautiful heartfelt comment you left. I really appreciate it. And it is comments like yours that keep me inspired to make videos like this one. And really everyone who leaves a comment. It, it's all of the comments, at least all of the nice ones. Um, keep me motivated to keep going with this. So Ever in the Rising, um, part of what she said, so I'm starting at the, at the halfway point. She wrote, even with all you've been through, you still keep carrying on with the same open heart, self-trust, ethics, and enthusiasm, and that's so great to see. Maybe you know this already, but for many of us, recovering from much less things than full-on cult life can be a deep struggle within our self-esteem and mental health. My productivity suffers greatly when I suffer mentally or physically, but you seem more engaged than ever. You might not even notice all your best qualities like confidence and self-trust because to you, they're probably like breathing air. I think you did pick up over the course of this video. So sorry, this was a comment on my last video where I made this drawing. Um, how what many people to what many people is common sense is actually just shared collective understanding by people with like experiences. It's not accessible for everyone, especially those of us from broken homes who weren't engaged with enough as kids or who have disabilities and traumas. I'd love to hear you speak more, especially about how you have such an effortless confidence and trust in yourself that you will move forward and everything will be okay. So yeah, like I mentioned earlier in the video, it might seem like I have an effortless confidence and trust in myself, but it's not, I mean, it's effortless now that I've rebuilt it, but it wasn't like I bounced back out of that cult abuse situation and instantly had confidence again. Um, so I want to talk a bit about that just so that I'm not setting an impossible example because even I couldn't be doing what I'm doing now. For example, a year and a half ago when I first got out of that cult, I ghosted all of my friends on social media and YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, everything for at least three months when I escaped from the cult. I didn't make a single post or a comment or a video because I felt like I had failed myself in life so much that I couldn't possibly have anything to say to anybody else that would be in any way beneficial um, because I really felt like my life was just a train wreck when I came back from India. And I mean, it's true, like I, I appreciate what you've said ever in the rising, that I'm more engaged and productive now than ever. That is true, but I, I wasn't like that at the point when I would say it's like I hit rock bottom. So when I first left that cult and I was still going through a deprogramming process, I was still trying to figure out how much of it was true and how much of it was bullshit, if any of it was true. And I wasn't sure if, for example, the teachers in the Gurukul who ordered the kids to beat each other, Ma Advait specifically, I wasn't sure, like, did Ma Advait abuse all of these kids of her own volition or was she instructed by the fraud guru who calls himself Nityananda? Like, was it him who told her to make the kids beat each other? So I didn't want to speak against him 
if there was still a doubt in my mind as to whether or not he was the the catalyst for the problem or if she took matters into her, her own hands and she was the problem and of course now i know for a fact he instructed her to beat the kids because one of the 18 plus gurukul students who i've spoken to confirmed for me that she was with maud Veit when maud Veit got the phone call telling her to do it um but you know what? Even if Ma Advait had done that by herself, instead of doing it by the fraud guru's instructions, even if it had been her own free will decision to do that, he would still be at fault for enabling it and not banning her from the Sangha and forbidding her to interact with kids. Like the fact that it happened at all is unacceptable and inexcusable. But when I first left the cult, I wasn't mentally strong enough to bring that to the public because it was still processing within me. I was still digesting from that experience and going through a very intense phase of self-reflection, um, trying to see why I was caught up in that drama for so long and why I was such a true believer in something so obviously false. One thing that helped me get through that was watching YouTube videos of other cult survivors. Like there are some TED Talks out there, mainly of people who escaped from extremely oppressive Christian communities, like people who broke free from the Amish community, um, people who broke out of the Westboro Baptist Church and other kind of hate groups, like these militant Christian cults. And of course, the videos about Scientology by people like Chris Shelton. I'm, I'm one of his biggest fans. He has a channel called The Critical Thinker, and he really opened up about how his critical thinking skills came back slowly when he got out of Scientology, and how for him he could see that people like David Miscavige was abusing his power at the helm of Scientology, but he still believed at first in what L. Ron Hubbard had written in his science fiction novels that got turned into this mockery of a religion, this like pseudoscience religious cult. And I found that so relatable and so helpful because I went through a similar process of trying to figure out how much of what we were taught in that cult was genuine Hinduism and you know, ancient spiritual re belief and ritual, and how much of it was just a crazy concoction of that fraud created to enslave people and drain us of our resources, money and time and talent. And it's, it's kind of a long process. I don't think it's something that can ever be finished. As long as there are still people in that cult there are still aspects of the cult that seem good, at least good enough to keep those people in that kind of mental bondage. But anyway, I, I didn't want to turn this video into a cult-centric video. I basically just wanted to give this as some background as to why my self-confidence and self-esteem and communication ability and joy in life in general it's not something that's a given. It's not like if somebody comes up and punches me in the face, I'm going to be in a good mood and happy and roll with it, roll with the punch and, and just be cool. Like, of course, I would hate that and it would probably ruin my day and I'd feel crappy. And those days I would not, not that anybody's ever randomly come up and punched me in the face like in public before, but, um, it's not like no matter what happens, I always feel great. It's partly that when I'm feeling great, I make a YouTube video because that's the perfect time to share with other people. Um, I'm gonna grab my pen. I'm sorry guys, I did not come prepared today. Uh, I was so excited and eager to show the postcards and my new business cards that I forgot to pick up my trusty Uniball pen. Um, anyhow, the reason I started with an image of the last video's drawing on screen 
is that ever in the rising who's um a part of her comment i just read she also wrote that she wants a copy of this piece uncolored just as it is and said that it looks like a bird flying out of a hotel room lobby into a swirling rainforest sunset that is just the coolest description i've ever read for one of my pictures i'm trying to figure out where's the hotel lobby and where's the bird and where's the sunset where's the tropical forest like um i'm going to scan this and upload it into a facebook group i created called sarah's coloring club so anybody who wants a copy of this piece as it is uncolored you can just download it and print it for free um if you you don't even have to join the coloring club. You can join it to see the picture and then leave it if you feel like it. Um, but that way you can all have a copy of this. And Ever in the Rising, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know your real name, just your YouTube screen name. Um, but yeah, if you want a physical copy of this, send me a message in Etsy. And once I've done my next round of printing and gotten all of my illustrations ready for the coloring book, I will send you as a gift a physical copy of this. I'll sign it, I'll send it to you um, because I'm just so grateful for your comment and for inspiring the topic of today's video. And maybe you can take a picture and send it back to me highlighting where you see the tropical rainforest sunset and where you see the bird flying and where you see the hotel room because I'm just very curious now. For that matter, okay, last thing I'm going to tell you guys before I start the drawing and talking about this topic. Last thing is that, as I said, I left the backs of these postcards totally blank for the people who want to do mail art, but if you want me to sign the back and put like a little sticker uh, showing my my art. Um, if you choose to have it signed, I will sign it in the bottom left hand corner so that the main part will still be blank if you want to write on it or draw on it or send it. Um, but yeah, if you want it signed, I'll sign it. And if you want it for doing mail art, I will leave it as it is so you can collage or whatever. Um, so I can't draw on the back of this one because it already is on the back of another drawing. And so is this one. And here I found one that is still blank on the reverse. It's got some ink smudges unfortunately, but I think I can work those into the drawing. I don't think I can. I know I can. I, I'm so cheap that I always draw on the front and the back of every page. So I've become somewhat adept at finding ink smears and stains and just working them into it because I don't want to waste the paper. And especially because the kind of pen I work with, this Uniball Vision, it is waterproof and it is fade proof, which means once it's dry, it, it's permanent. Like you can wet it down with watercolors or go over it with alcohol inks or water inks or anything really and it stays put but while it's still wet it smudges like that um, so I've kind of learned how to work with the smudges and not let them ruin a piece and you know what there is my unintentional analogy for today's video topic working with the smudges and turning them into a part of the piece so in this comment how she had said that you know my my self-esteem and my confidence that everything is going to turn out right is i guess seems like that's just something i have naturally but that is something that i've really worked on i'm gonna close my laptop now that i'm finished reading that comment don't waste the battery um but it's not something that was totally natural. Uh, I had a tremendous fear of public speaking and I had a tremendous fear of talking to the camera before I started this YouTube channel. And, you know, it, it used to really bother my mom. She would get really 
annoyed with me and really um, disappointed because on occasions like my birthday or Christmas when I was opening presents, I didn't want my picture taken because I hated the way I looked in pictures. And I think, I don't, it, I don't know whether it's because my mind was filled with advertising images of beautiful, heavily made up, skinny, retouched models. And so I would hold myself to the standard of socially accepted societal beauty. I don't know if it was that or if it was the fact that I got really badly bullied as a kid for my appearance. The, the other kids at school called me ugly and fat and um, there was no such thing as body positivity in those days. In the, I make it sound like I'm 80 years old, but back, in, back when I was young, um, it was the 90s. Like I started grade one in 1990, into 1991, so the majority of my grade one year was 91. And so if you think back to the 90s, it was like the only acceptable look in a fashion magazine was like a size zero, super, super skinny model. And on television, it was only skinny people. Um, here's some 90s nostalgia. My favorite TV show when I was in grade one was Full House. I loved that show. Um, when I got home from school, it was usually the first thing on. And yeah, I, I, I would make my mom watch that with me while we ate dinner because I just freaking loved it. Mostly because I loved Uncle Jesse. Other 90s girls will know, like, yeah. Um, but I saw an interview recently with Candace Cameron who played DJ Tanner, like the big sister on the show Full House. And she was talking about how the producers of the show used to want her to lose weight and diet because she was naturally a little bit chubby and, you know, a, a healthy size and a healthy weight for somebody her age. But the 90s beauty standard, they even made an episode of the show where her character goes on a crash diet and just faints one day because she basically goes anorexic. She stops eating, starts counting her calories and over exercising. And, you know, anybody who knows about health and fitness, you'll know um, if you limit, if you reduce your calories to less than the daily recommended intake and you increase the amount you work out, yeah, you're gonna get skinny, but you're probably going to faint. Your health will suffer in the process. Like you won't, um, you know, there, there's that thing where they say calories in, calories out, like work out as much as the amount of calories you consume. But what people forget is that just by breathing, just by your heart pumping blood, just by talking, just by your daily, walk about like the the actions you take in the day you do burn calories so you have to eat enough to stay healthy and active anyway i'm i'm not even a health expert so talk to a dietitian or somebody if if you're thinking about losing weight but yeah a, as a child who grew up in the 90s who is naturally like my body type naturally even if i'm exercising and walking and doing yoga and, and doing some light weight lifting. Um, even though I keep a healthy, active lifestyle and eat a very well-balanced vegan diet, I'm just naturally a bit curvy, guys. And I'm cool with that now in the 2020 um, post-body shaming era, post-fat shaming era where you know, it's cool to be thick. I would have been like the most popular girl if like the thick look had been in when I was in high school, but it was not. <laughs> anyway, I, I hated having my picture taken. Um, when one of my uncles got a camcorder and he used to film, 
family birthday parties and holidays and stuff, I would literally hide in my grandparents' bathroom and lock the door until somebody told me it was safe to come out, that the video camera is put away. So if somebody had told me, you know, back then, that one day I would film videos and put them on this thing called the internet for anybody and everybody to watch, I wouldn't have believed it. And the other thing is that I was really shy and had very low self-esteem, probably because I got bullied. But if somebody had told me that I would expose a cult and in the process of exposing that cult, wind up with a shitload of haters who think I'm evil because they believe that the leader of that cult who brainwashed them is the god Shiva. I would never have believed that either. I'd think, okay, even if I find out that somebody is a cult leader and is evil, I'll just keep my mouth shut about it because I don't want to cause conflict. Like, I, I don't want, um, I don't want to be disliked, you know? I, I don't want people saying mean things about me. I think the confidence I have now, the self-confidence and the self-esteem that I guess it it seems natural, but it is something I worked hard for. And it really started when, back in, I guess, mid-2009, like spring, summer of 2009, is that pivotal transformational time in my life where I really feel I became myself. Um, up until then, I think I mentioned I know I mentioned that I guess I kind of blew the secrecy that the terrible high pressure sales commission based fashion retail environment where my bully boss used to uh, parade me around the store checking for dust in random places where nobody would ever look like under carpets and behind mirrors and on top of door frames was DKNY. Please don't sue me. Um, yeah, at the time that I worked there, my self-esteem was really low because all of the salespeople were basically pitted against each other in this corporate-driven competition to get the highest sales. And the, the person who sold the most stuff who earned the most money for the store would win like gift certificates and free stuff or get like a higher percentage bonus for their commission that month. Um, it was no fun for somebody like me who like my sales pitch method is like, look at these pretty gemstones. If you like them, buy them. If not, that's cool too. Like enjoy what you do buy in any other place no pressure. Like my, my typical way of trying to sell something is not to. I'll share what I like. I'll, I'll talk about what interests me. Um, I'm super excited about my new, my new postcard prints. And yeah, of course I want to sell. I, I would love it if they all sell out and I earn a bit of money and I can invest that money into printing a, a larger run of, of more art and making a coloring book and, and following my art dream. Like, of course I want that, but I am not a high pressure kind of salesperson who's going to make a video and say, like, your life will be so much better if you buy my postcards and do you want to manifest wealth? Buy some citrine pendants from my store. Like, I'll... I will make videos where I talk about the good properties of these things, but I, I will never be pushy. And it seemed like the retail environment rewards the people who are pushy. And unfortunately, a lot of customers will buy something that they don't want and don't need, and even more sadly, can't afford because a pushy salesperson 
convinces them that it's a good investment and that they'll regret it if they don't buy it and that they'll be so much happier in life if they have these boots or that purse or this jacket. Um, and of course, pop culture and the music industry don't do much to help, right? Like what, what songs get really popular? I was shocked and appalled when I got out of that cult and kind of came out from under the rock I was hiding in in India for years and found out that like what passes for lyricism is like Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang. Like how freaking dumb is that? Um, it, it just tells people that they need these like overpriced, ridiculous looking uh, clothes that are going to be out of fashion two years from now anyway. Okay, rent over. I, I don't want to make this a an anti-designer apparel video. But yeah, back when I was working in in the high-end fashion retail world, looks were very important. We had to wear a certain amount of makeup to work every day and we had to wear the the latest styles. We couldn't appear you know, out of fashion while working in a place where it's our job to sell the latest fashion. And again, like back, back then, there were days when I would go home from work and literally just cry because I felt so inauthentic. I, I felt like the way I described it in one of my diaries back then, I made this really mournful diary entry where I said like it would be less despicable to be an actual whore than to be this kind of a corporate whore and I, I was like basically lamenting on the fact that okay if I sold my body which I never have and wouldn't do and I, I don't I'm not advocating that and I'm not saying that that would actually be better like Dude, if you work fashion retail, don't listen to what I'm saying and think, okay, I'll quit that and start start prostituting myself. That's not what I mean. But at that time, there was a day when I didn't deliberately do it, but I sold a lambskin kind of fur coat. A, a lambskin. It looks like leather, but it's baby lambs who have been killed and turned into it. And... The store had, I think, just one of that style, and it was $3,000. And we had all been told that there would be a $200 cash bonus to whoever sells it. And I told all of my coworkers, I don't even want this cash bonus. If any customer is interested in that, you take them. I cannot have the blood on my hands from being the person who sells this. And it's kind of like life lessons will sometimes happen to us um, in a way that we're kind of forced to re-examine all of our choices. We, we can't stay complacent anymore because right after that sales incentive was announced, a lady walked in one day when I was on shift and she walked right up to me and said, I'll take that coat. And she pointed at the lambskin coat. And I said, oh, let me just get one of my coworkers so you can try it on. And she said, no, I've already tried it on in the New York store. I, I know it fits, I've tried it on. I want it, I'll take it. And then I said, okay, just, uh, just one moment. And then I called one of my coworkers and I was like, he was on his lunch break, but I remember I was like, hey, Josh, uh, there's a customer here for you. And she, she heard that phone call and she said, no, I need this right now. I can't wait for somebody else to come downstairs. It's your sale. You take it, you ring it in. Like, that's it. Like she wouldn't have it. I could not pass her on to somebody else. And so I rang in that coat and I won the special cash bonus for it. And that night I just went home and I cried and cried and cried. And like, like I, I was making annual donations to various animal rights charities. 
And so I have like calendars for the SPCA and you know, promotional material from PETA and stuff like that, like all these different animal rights groups. I looked at all of those and felt like I should be out protesting along with the other brave people who protest against stores like the one that I'm working at. And how, how much of a difference does it make if I'm vegan, if I'm still a whore to the corporation that sells dead cows and dead calves in the form of boots and shoes and purses and shit and it's inexcusable there's no need for it you can make stuff that's just as good out of cork out of waxed cotton for raincoats like you don't need to kill an animal for fashion anymore um so yeah at that point in time my self-esteem was so low because what I was doing was in an exact anti antithesis to what I believed. I, I believed one thing and I did the opposite. And I think, you know, of course I couldn't have started a YouTube channel like this back at that point in time because how could how can you speak with any level of joy if you're miserable and how can you demonstrate creative ability if you just don't feel creative i wasn't drawing like this back then i wouldn't have kept like a a thick sketchbook like this one filled with pieces that i'm super proud of and that i love planning to publish as a coloring book because I think the, the vibe that you're feeling comes through in what you do. So even if I had made a picture back then, it wouldn't have had that same energy that I, that I feel could actually potentially benefit somebody else if they look at it. So I mean, when I was really young, I had low self-esteem because of my, my weight and because of my appearance. And then in my early 20s, when, when I think that my, my looks kind of blossomed and I got complimented a lot and people told me I was beautiful all the time and, you know, strangers would stop me in the street to compliment me, um, I had low self-esteem not because of my appearance but because I felt like a hypocrite inside, working at exactly the kind of store that sold merchandise that I find morally objectionable. So I don't think self-esteem is independent of your identity and your expression and your choices in life. I think self-esteem is cultivated not by making a decision that now I'm going to be confident and believe in myself but it's, it's directly related to the choices that we make in any given situation to do what inspires us and what we're happy and proud of and what we feel is harmonious with our true selves. There are a lot of people who tend to troll artists and creative types. Um, I started watching some other YouTube artists just for fun. Most of them are illustrators. They do kind of cartoony stuff, anime inspired stuff. Um, and, and almost all of them have made videos where they respond to their critics saying, you know, this person commented on my video that I should get a real job instead of just drawing my pictures. and. You know, that person commented that my art isn't real art. And I mean, I've, I've made a video about that too, right? I can relate. And a lot of these artists on YouTube have spoken about how friends of theirs will ask them for free art. And if they tell their friends, like, okay, the, the drawing that you want me to make it's going to take me four hours first to do the base sketch, the preliminary sketch, and then to make sure that you're, you're happy with it. And then inking it will take another hour. Coloring it in will take a couple of hours. So four hours of work. 
um, plus the materials, like normally I would charge $250 for this, so I can't give it to you for free. And then their friends would respond something like, well, I have to work a real job and I can't afford to pay $250. Aren't you my friend? Why don't you just give it to me? And so these people who define their productivity as a real job versus a creative person's productivity as what, a fake job or a fantasy job or a fun job? I think it's all related to choosing what you do versus doing what you think you have to do to get by, right? And it, it makes me think of how I used to feel about my life and the world back when I worked a quote unquote like real job, when I worked at a fashion retail store. And I can kind of see this from both sides, right? Because when I was slaving away for my $11 an hour, um, keeping busy doing menial labor tasks like cleaning up people's messes and fitting rooms and steaming wrinkles out of hard to steam fabric and forcing myself to be a salesperson for things that I would really prefer people boycott. If somebody had told me I could commission an artist to make a beautiful image for $250, I probably would have reacted like these bad friends in art YouTubers video stories and thought like $250, that is half a week's work. I'm not gonna slave away for two and a half days doing something I hate to pay that person to do something they love to do already. Like, why can't they just make me the picture? But if every artist who does what they love for a living just made people pictures for free all the time, they would have to get jobs they hate and therefore they wouldn't have the time and the energy and the enthusiasm or the mind space to make those beautiful images and they wouldn't make them for free because they wouldn't be able to. It's kind of like in order to be inspired and productive and creative, you, it's more than just the will to make something. It's also the energy to actually do it. Like how many people have said, I would love to write a book about this, or if I could learn anything, I would learn another language, or if I could do anything, I would learn to draw, or, you know, I wish I had time to learn how to watercolor paint. I mean, I even see comments like that. And motivational speakers and, you know, people like, what's his name, Tony Robinson? Is that the guy's name? You know, the, those, those grandstanding, you can do it people, they'll be so quick to say like, well, if you want to learn this, just set aside this much time every day and start doing it. But if you're going out every single day into a hostile work environment where you feel that you're compromising your integrity just to do what your boss tells you to do, when you get home, you're probably going to just want to lounge on the couch and watch other people do things, either in YouTube videos or on TV or in movies or on Netflix or in a video game. It, it's really hard to describe, but when people comment on how prolific I am as an artist, how many pieces I make in a week and how I can draw for hours, it's, it's not like I've got a superpower. It's that I've made a decision to take a risk in life, um, to venture out on my own as a self-employed person where my income is very unstable and it's hard to, it's hard to plan and budget because one month sales in Etsy will be great and then a pandemic happens and the sales crash. You know, it's, it's not as, um, like there's pros and cons to everything, right? Like when I worked those retail jobs that I hated, I knew for a fact I had this much money coming in every month plus bonus if I got commissions. So I, I knew 
I could always afford rent and food and internet and cell phone bill. And I'm, I'm very, very fortunate and grateful to my fairly loyal customers in Etsy. It's, it's usually the same people who come back and buy things. Um, I'm very grateful to my patrons over on Patreon who I, I use the money I get from Patreon to pay for my internet bill because I had to go with the really pricey package in order to be able to upload long videos like this one. If, if I go for the cheaper internet package, it takes like 10 hours to upload a video and sometimes the upload can't like crashes and I lose it and I have to start over. So like there have been times when it's taken me like three days to upload one video. Um, so whatever generous contributions people make on Patreon, I use that for my internet and for my technology. So for example, I bought a, a new light so that I can film any time of day and have proper lighting. I haven't used it yet because now that it's springtime, the sun rises at like 5 a.m. and sets at like 9.30, so I've got a really wide window for filming. But when fall and winter come again, I'm sure I'll make really good use out of that, that donut-shaped light thingy. Um, I bought my tripod with that money. I Basically, I use Patreon money to fund my channel because that's what it's there for. Um, and I also took my lawyer fees out of that when I, when I had an affidavit signed and legally notarized to send to India. Because I first started that Patreon based on my cult exposure work, now it's more geared towards art. So what I give my Patreons for that, for their contribution, um, is a monthly Zoom session where they can ask me anything, show anything. We do art show and tells and Q and A's and stuff. And I make private videos just for them. Sometimes they've got questions that I don't want to get too controversial on my YouTube channel publicly, so I don't want to make a public video out of those questions. But I'll make private videos um, visible just to my patrons. Anyway, it, it was a gamble when I made the decision not to work in a job that conflicts with my personal ethics. Um, I don't want to say easier, harder, but no, I do want to say that. It, it might be easier for me if I just went out and found another retail job, but I could never guarantee, for example, say if I got a nice job at a place like the body shop again, which is against animal testing, and that's great. And a lot of their products are vegan, and that's great. But some of their products contain milk powder, like their milk baths. Um, I think some of their glycerin soaps contain honey. Like not all of the stuff that they sell is actually vegan. So, is that a compromise I'd be willing to make? No. Um, so, financially, it might be easier to just work a regular job. And then, of course, there's the other option, which is not to, not to take a, a sales job or, you know, a, a service job, but to go back to school and finish my fine arts degree and go into gallery work. When I was younger, I've, I've got to make a video about this. Maybe my next video will be about the places I used to volunteer when I was young because I, I volunteered at a place called the Sikokotoki Friendship Center, which is our local First Nations um, community center. And it's, it's a shelter, so homeless, homeless people who are of the First Nations can stay there. Um, and a soup kitchen, and they have regular powwows and dance gatherings, and it was really a beautiful experience volunteering there. Um, because for my high school, like I went to Catholic school, 
They wouldn't give us the full credits to graduate from grade 12 unless we got 40 hours of, com of community service in. So the places I volunteered were the Friendship Center, the Paw Society, which is an animal shelter, of course, um, and the Southern Alberta Art Gallery. And what was really funny was that the, the people at the Southern Alberta Art Gallery, when I started volunteering there, um, I told them that I, I needed the volunteer experience to graduate. And they thought that I was graduating from the fine arts program at the University of Lethbridge. So they thought that I was just finishing my degree um, because I guess I, I looked older than my age and I've always been really mature. They didn't realize I was a 17 year old kid. And when I graduated, they offered me a job, a, a salaried position as the education coordinator. And it was when I sat down to fill out the paperwork for this like dream job. Um, it was then that like when it, when it asked me what my, if I had a singular major or a split major, like whether I had taken just fine arts or if I had taken art and education, I said to the lady, like I, I took art classes, but they didn't offer education classes at my high school. That's when they realized I was only 17 and, and not actually with my bachelor degree yet. Um, but anyway, the, the lovely lady who was the director of the gallery there had promised me that once I finished art school, there would be a job waiting for me. Um, so I mean, I, I could choose to finish school and go the, the academic route and then get a, you know, a professional career kind of a job. But again, how much am I willing to bend my personal ethics to accommodate a workplace? Um, because the gift shop there sells leather things. Some of the artists who exhibit, exhibit disgusting crap like, you know, like meat suits, like that monstrosity that what's her name who calls her fans little monsters i forget her name she's one of those love her or hate her kind of people and i don't hate anybody but i strongly dislike her um anyway like would i would i be okay with it in a curator position at a gallery or an education coordinator position at a gallery if if i was required to again sell animal byproducts or speak up and endorse something that I'm morally opposed to? And again, the answer is no. Um, so it might seem like I'm choosing kind of an antisocial life to be self-employed and to be very choosy about my form of self-employment, like working with only vegan watercolor paints and cruelty-free papers. For example, I buy Strathmore brand watercolor paper because the other brands use gelatin in sizing the paper. And I only use Uniball pens because other brands of pens use shellac, which comes from a beetle. It, it you know, it, it might not be the financially good move, but for me, that's why I'm able to make videos like this and just exude confidence because I'm genuinely proud of everything I do. Um, I, I love my style of art, so I think I, I share it well when I describe it. And I love the jewelry that I make. When I've made cords for the, for the jewelry, I always make them out of hemp because it's sustainable, it's renewable, it's cruelty-free, it's environmentally friendly. Um, I'll never make anything out of leather. And even, even the best place I've ever worked meaning for somebody else, even the best job I've ever had, which was at a store called Dragon Space on Granville Island in Vancouver. I, I freaking love that store. Like I am a fangirl of that store. Like when I go back to Vancouver, I will drop whatever spending money I happen to have at that store. I love it so much. Um, but even there, some of the consignment pieces that they sold were leather, hand-bound leather journals. 
and handmade leather hair accessories and you know there was an artist who made like leather cuff bracelets and stuff and I was never okay about it when I had to sell those. Now luckily my coworkers there were so conscious and so um, accommodating to me that if somebody wanted to look at a leather journal if, if they heard a customer come up to me and say, hey, can you open this case? I want to look at those leather journals. One of my coworkers would say, oh, it's okay, Sarah, I'll take this one. You know, so they never put me in a position where I had to touch the dead cow skin. But I, like, I'm, like I said, even then, being in a, in a work environment where I'm not excited about everything feels like it would be taking a step backwards. Now, I, I know that it's not immediately possible for everybody to, you know, quit your day job and start following your passion immediately. And I'll tell you how I did it. Um, coming back to what I said earlier, which is that it was the summer of 2009 when I feel like I truly became myself the reason is, I, I had a very mystical experience. And I'm going to tell you about this mystical experience because I've censored myself enough when it comes to mystical experiences um, for fear that they might mislead people. But I've done a lot of soul searching and meditating on this. And I really think so many people, in, including the lovely lady who left the comment I'm answering today, resonated with it when I used to talk about synchronicities and the divine and stuff like this. It's part of me, so if you don't like it, you don't have to listen to it. But if you like this kind of stuff, you'll like this story. Um, every summer, the place that my mom and my Auntie Mary Lynn and I love to go is Waterton Lakes National Park. It, it's like, even back when I lived in Vancouver, I would make an annual trip back to Alberta to visit family. And that was like our must do. Everything else, like if we got around to it, we would do it. But one thing that's like a, what's the word for it? Like mandatory, a compulsory aspect of my visits home was always a, a day trip to Waterton. And there was a, a very um, sad trip that I made home one summer because I had to come home at an unexpected time. I had to travel. So I'm setting down my pen for a second because even though I can normally draw and talk at the same time, there are some topics where I need to just talk and it would be too distracting to draw as I talk. But there was one year, it was 2007, when my beloved cat Sneaky passed away and like growing up getting teased at school and having like weird girls I went to class with who would sometimes just be you know I don't want to call another girl a bitch because that's not right but they they would act very witchy with a b um it's like my cat was my best friend. He was my safe space. I could come home and cry into his fur and just feel comforted. And I know some people are dog people, but I am a cat person. Um, cats have an intuitive way of knowing when their person is feeling down and, and they will come to us and comfort us and purr on our laps and love us. And did you know that a cat's purr has a certain vibration to it that actually builds up bone density. And so people who have cats, who regularly cuddle with their cats and have their cats purr on their lap, uh, have a much lower risk of getting osteoporosis because the cat's purr builds up the bone density. So, I mean, there's like, there's a medical benefit to being a cat person. But my, my cat, Sneaky, he was my, everything like he would cuddle with me every night and he would meet me at the door when I came home from school and follow me around the house he was just I'd even play fetch with him the way people sometimes play fetch with their dogs I've never met another cat who does this um he would bring me his green pom-pom ball which was his favorite toy 
and I'd stand at one end of the hall and I would throw it for him to the other end of the hall and he would run and grab it and he would bring it back to me. And the first time we did this, he would drop it on my feet and I'd throw it for him again, but he's so intelligent that it came to a point when he would keep it in his mouth until I held out my hand and he would drop the ball into my hand for me to throw it for him again. So he was a smart kitty. And I didn't want to move to Vancouver to go to art school in 2005 because I, I used to say to my mom, I can't move away from home as long as Sneaky is still alive. I feel like I'm abandoning him. I feel too guilty. But because I had taken two years off after high school, she basically kind of told me, if, if you take any more years off, you're going to lose control of your life and you'll never... You'll never go to school, you won't move away, you won't do anything. Like basically like sat me down and had an intervention and said, get your portfolio together because you're going to art school. Um, so I did. And even after I left art school, I had become so attached to Vancouver. My friends were all there. My then boyfriend had moved out to live with me there. Um, I didn't come back to Lethbridge. And so one sad day, I got a phone call in the morning and my mom said, like, call work and tell them you can't come. Back then, work was DKNY, so my life pretty much sucked. I hated my job. I had a very um, emotionally abusive then boyfriend. He wasn't a good guy at all. So it, it's like the thing I would look forward to most was coming home for visits twice a year, summertime and Christmas time. And a big part of that was my cat, Sneaky. Like when I would come home for a visit, no matter how many months had gone by, he would just jump into my arms and purr. And a lot of idiotic so-called experts will say that the cat's memory doesn't go more than two weeks back, but that's bull. Like, because this cat was very choosy. He didn't like just anybody. He would run away and hide if strangers came into the house. So what the first trip I made home after going to art school, I was scared that Sneaky and his sister Snoops, who really Snoops bonded mostly to my mom and Sneaky bonded mostly to me, um, but I was really afraid that they'd forget me and that that would have been just a crushing, devastating blow, but no, nah, he remembered me. Um, that first night when I came back home visiting from art school, I woke up in the morning and every single cat toy in our house was piled onto my bed. And cats will do this. They'll give people little presents. Um, people who have outdoor cats will sometimes get unwanted, very sad, devastating little presents like birds and mice and stuff. But thank God my cats were indoor cats. And so instead of hunting for me, he would catch pom-pom balls and socks and cat toys for me. Um, but yeah, I got a sad call one day and my mom said, call into work. Um, she told me, sit down for this. And she said, he's still alive, but, and I just burst into tears because I knew she meant sneaky. And she said that the vet wanted to put him down that day, but that she had begged them. And, and this is something that makes me mad. Did you know that if you have a sick pet and take it to the vet, if they if they determine that there's nothing they can do to extend the cat's life or the quality of life, they're under some kind of ridiculous legal obligation that they have to kill the animal. I hate that. I freaking hate that because I believe in karma and spirituality and that a natural life cycle and lifetime exists for a reason. I don't think we should choose when to end an animal's life debate me on that if you want. Please, actually, please don't debate me. I, I don't want my comment section to turn into an argument. If you disagree, let's amicably disagree because I, I can understand why some people say it puts them out of their misery and it's compassionate. Okay, fine. Agree to disagree. I, I feel like the animal should be kept in as loving and comfortable and safe supportive environment as possible until it's that animal's natural time and they choose to leave their body. That's how I feel. Um, 
but my mom basically had to beg the vet to let Sneaky stay alive until I could get there to say my goodbyes. So I, I called, this was the one thing, uh, all the complaining I've done, this was one situation in which DKNY was really good to me because I, I called the store manager, the boss's son, and told him, like, he could probably barely understand me through my sobs. I told him I have to go home immediately. Um, there's a family emergency. I didn't tell him it was an animal, my cat. I, I told, I said, family emergency, I have to go. And he said, I started to explain that it was my cat. And he said, no, 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 that's okay. I don't need to know the details. Just go tell me when you're going to be back. We'll figure out the schedule. Don't worry about it. And to this day, I'm grateful for that because it might have been overcomplicated if I had lost my job or something. But I, I came back to Lethbridge. They let us take Sneaky home overnight so I, I could spend one last night cuddling with him. And they told us that if he, if he wasn't dead by morning, we had to drive him in to be put down. And I fought against that and I resisted that, but... I was still, even though I was in my 20s, like, I was still the kid and my mom was still the mom. And it was kind of like her house, her rules, and she made that decision to end his life. It's kind of like pulling the plug. The, the most painful experience I've had in my life till now, and I've had some, I've had some shit in my life, but the saddest thing I've lived through is still the loss of my cat, Sneaky. It's like, I can't talk about it any more than that or else I'm gonna start crying and that's a little too real for one of these YouTube videos. Um, but anyhow, after he had been put down, now I can start drawing again because painful memory is, a, is pretty much over. But um, when he was put down, the vet looked at the records and said, huh. And, you know, my mom asked, like, what? And she said, well, it's a year, a month, and a day since Snoop's passed away, Sneaky's little sister. And of course, that was also devastating, and I cried my eyes out for a week when she passed away. Um, but on our drive back to, to my mom's house, she said like one year, one month, and one day, like one, one, one. And I told her, it'll be like a sign that we did the right thing and, and that Snoops and Sneaky are happy wherever their little souls have gone from here, whatever journey those little beings are taking. Uh, if we see the number 111, we'll know that we're in the right place at the right time and the right thing is happening. And, you know, the, the very next day, we decided to drive to Waterton kind of as a consolation for ourselves because being in that house, every, like, the couch was Sneaky's couch. His toys were all over the floor. The litter box was still there in its spot like there were too many sad reminders so we went to Waterton and on our way out of town we stopped to pick up snacks in case there wasn't anything vegan there and I, I, I'll never forget I bought a bottle of water and a bag of almonds and the change was a dollar eleven a loony a dime and a penny one 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 and I, I showed it to my mom and I showed her the receipt and it said like change 1.11. And it's not like I had selected those items or decided to give $10 bill as a payment deliberately to get that change. Like it was a, a pure synchron synchronicity, a total coincidence. And I told her like, here's my sign that Snoops and Sneaky wherever their souls have moved on to now, I trust that they have gone to the right place for, for, their, for their passage. And that was amazing. And I also told my mom that I wanted to find a piece of iolite. Like this was long before I had an Etsy shop or 
a stockpile of gemstones, so I, I didn't have any iolite yet. But I had read in a book called Love is in the Earth by Melody, and in the Book of Stones, that iolite is a good gem of the shaman to communicate with animals and with those who have crossed over, those who have passed away. So I wanted a piece of, of sorry, iolite in hopes that if I put it under my pillow at night, maybe I would get to see my cats in a dream. Um, or if, if I sent a, a loving message out there into existence in hopes that it would reach them, maybe I would feel something come back. So I told my mom um, that I wanted to go into any shop on in Waterton that might possibly sell gemstones because I want some iolite. And one of the first shops, sorry, I need to sip my tea. My voice is getting dry. Um, any shop that we went into, like she told me, don't get your hopes up. Like that's not a common stone. If, if you want to find like turquoise or BC, ja BC Jade or something, it'll be there, but iolite. But anyhow, the, the first shop we went into, um, I forget what it's called now. Oh, this is going to bug me. As soon as I stop filming, I'm going to remember what it's called. But it, it's this beautiful little resort hotel um, that also has a, a gift shop. And what's interesting is that I was standing at the gemstone case looking at all of their jewelry I didn't see any iolite but I was still checking out their designs and the lady who worked there walked up to me and said you have such a strong shakti and I had never heard the word shakti before and I asked her what she meant by that and she said it means energy you have such a strong energy what kind of meditations do you do? Like, tell me, what, what's your spiritual practice? And at that point in time, I wasn't doing any spiritual practice. And so some of this must be nature, not nurture. Some of this must be inherently inborn in us. Because like I said, back then, I worked at DKNY. I was mourning the loss of my best friend. And... To me, he wasn't an animal. He wasn't a pet. You don't own a pet. Like, you're lucky if an animal bonds with you and becomes a friend. So it, it's not like I was in a very positive mental space back then. Um, but even still, this, this lady recognized something in me and she just said, you have such a strong shakti. What kind of meditation do you do? And I told her, I, I wear a lot of gemstones. Like I, I showed her my moonstone that I was wearing at the time um, for divine feminine energy. And she said, there's something more than that. She pointed at that case and she said, we have tons of moonstones here. That's not what I'm feeling. It's something more. And I asked her, do you have any iolite? And her eyes got so big, like she, she took a step back and she said, are you asking me for iolite? And I, I was kind of like, okay, what's, what's the big deal? Like, yeah, it's a rare stone, but it's not that rare. And so I, I just said like, yes, I'm, I would love to get some iolite. And she said, we had one iolite pendant and it sold this morning and it was returned by the person who bought it five minutes ago. So it's not on the shelf, but it's in the till. And I said, oh my God, like you, you had just one and it sold, but it just got returned like right before I came into the store. And she said, yes, can, can you believe it? Like, yeah, it just got returned. And so she said, I'm sure it's yours. It's meant for you. So of course I bought it and the lady there, I should mention, she was an Indian lady. Her name was Mariam. She said to me, you're going to India one day. You're going to go to India. And she said that as she handed me the receipt. And I looked at my mom and thought, like, India? 
Like, if you've ever seen the Seinfeld episode about India where it's Sue Ellen Mishki's wedding and everything happens backwards, the first thing Elaine says when she gets that wedding invitation is, like, India? I'm never going to India. That was kind of how I felt, except with less scorn, because I loved India. I just couldn't imagine a situation by which I would have a reason to go. But anyway, yeah, that, that lady, she is a visionary, I tell you. Um, so my mom and I left the store, and I looked at the receipt for my Iolite pendant before I slipped it in my purse. And holy effin' S-H-I-T, guys, like the receipt showed the address of the store, 111 Waterton Street. So that number 111 is literally on the receipt of the pendant I bought for hopes of connecting with Snoops and Sneaky. And 111 was the sign that we were going to look for to show that Snoops and Sneaky are in the right place. Um, that just you know that was that was it for me i knew that the souls that had incarnated in the bodies of those cute fuzzy little cuddly friends were in the right place at the right time moving on with their journeys and that's kind of when i knew i had to release them and, and stop i mean i still cried for a good month anytime i thought of my kitty but that was when I knew it was selfish of me to wish that he would live forever to serve me as my little cuddly friend, that each being incarnate has their own natural lifespan and that death isn't a terrible, tragic ending. It's the next step in our soul's journey. This life is just a one stop on the map of eternity. So scene 111, the other interesting thing that happened at that point in time was that as we were about to cross the street to go back to my mom's car, there was a car going by, one single car on that road, Waterton Street. The car's license plate said India. And I was like, holy crap, like, Whatever that Miriam lady said about me going to India one day, like here's the 111. They had this one Iolite that just came back before I went in. And now like of all the vanity plates this car, this driver could have chosen for his car, it's India. Like, holy crap. Um, I mean, I probably said something more. Um, whoops. Sorry, my battery's about to die. Okay, I'm so sorry I had to stop the video and start over again because the, the little pop-up came that my battery was running out and I had to plug it in. But I think what I was saying was that... Yeah, the car, the license plate said India, the receipt had 111. There was that one Iolite that had sold that day but came back. It just felt like... The synchronicities, I didn't even know the word synchronicity yet at that time. I just said these coincidences are too good to be regular coincidences. And of course, Q, the, the, the next obligatory Seinfeld reference, where that one lady, that cleaner lady said, there are no big coincidences and little coincidences. There are only coincidences. I totally disagree. There are big coincidences. Like, a little coincidence is... If there's a song that you love and it's like a top 40 hit and it's playing on the radio all the time and you get into your car and that song is playing, that's a little coincidence. If it's a current popular song that's likely to play. But if you've been thinking about somebody and there's a song you used to listen to together that was on the radio like in the 70s and you've, you haven't heard it since and you get into the car and that's the first song you hear, that's a big coincidence, right? So for me, the, the combination of that one piece of Iolite and the number 111 and the lady telling me I'd go to India and then a car drives by with a vanity plate that says India, like all of that was, now I know the word synchronicity, but back then I just said it was a big coincidence. So fast forward a couple of years um, 
The next year, my mom and I went back to Waterton again, as always in the summer. And of course, that, that same lady was working in the gift shop at 111 Waterton Street. And she remembered me. And she said, you were here last year, you bought the Iolite. You're so, you're so spiritual. She said she could feel my energy even more. And yeah, she told me again, you will be going to India. And I, like, I just believed her. Okay, I, I trust that. I don't know how or when or why. And then in 2009, right after I dumped my terrible then boyfriend and was no longer working at DKNY. I just want to give props though, where give credit where credit is due. When I got back to work at DKNY after my cat passed away and I told, I told my boss what the family emergency had been, that, that I lost my cat. Um, Nobody tried to make me feel bad about that. Nobody said that was it. It wasn't even a person. Like, no, they they hugged me and supported me and said, you know, if you tear up and need to leave the sales floor, just call somebody and they'll cover for you. Like, in that one regard, they were so good. Um, and even the lady who was the owner, who was kind of a classist businesswoman who she really had that that hong kong mentality um from from what my chinese coworkers told me i i was one of i was like the token white girl on staff most of the staff were were either people from hong kong or chinese like chinese like second generation chinese canadians um which is an an interesting fact about vancouver if you've never been there Vancouver has the biggest Chinatown in Canada and it is stunningly beautiful like they do a firework display every year and dragon parades and Chinese New Year is a big deal in Vancouver like we all have to know how to say gong hei fat choi because that day we say it to literally every customer who comes into our store wherever we're working but yeah my my Chinese co-workers told me that it's a very traditional Hong Kong mentality that the owner doesn't interact with the staff like you are beneath the store owner like if, if you work there you are her servant don't expect her to talk to you um, but that day when I was in the break room having my lunch Yvonne the the lady who oh shoot I wasn't gonna say any names whatever you you guys are cool you're not gonna like you know tell her to sue me I hope but she came up to me in the break room and she put her hand on my shoulder. This lady never touched anybody. Like the, the six foot rule that, that we're all obeying in the pandemic where we don't invade each other's personal bubble. Like that was her all the time year round, everyday rule. Like you, she would keep a distance from people. She wasn't a warm bubbly lady. She was like a, you know, she ran a tight ship. But she, she put her hand on my back and said, like, I just want you to know that the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life was when my puppy passed away. And she said, if, if you felt about your cat what I felt about my dog, then you don't have anything to worry about. Even if you want to take the rest of the day off, that's okay. I completely understand. You know, we're here to support you. And so it's like all the all the other stuff that I didn't like about her, because she was kind of a bully boss, to be honest. In my last video, I compared her to the the boss character in The Devil Wears Prada. Like she she was very Miranda Priestly about her work, but it's kind of like this made up for it because if that was the store where I had to work at the sad time in my life when I lost Sneaky, thank goodness my boss understood. Because I, when my cousin's cat passed away, and, and my cousin was as bonded to his cat as I was to Sneaky, he, he grieved and cried and felt it as 
equal if not worse to the loss of a person because at least if a, if a person you know is dying and I, I'm not trying to belittle the loss of a, of a human relative in any way I'm just saying in this one regard it can be worse to lose a pet because if you know a person is about to die you can you can talk to them you can tell them I'll always love you you can look in their eyes and tell them how much they meant to you in life. And, and you can, that, that is if it's not like an accidental or an unexpected death. But if somebody you know is really ill and they're passing away, I'm not saying it's less sad if a person dies. So please don't blast me in the comments about this. I'm just saying that when a person dies, you don't have that nagging, lingering feeling of what if they didn't know how I really felt about them because typically you have that chance to tell them. Or, or if you move away from home and you leave behind your brothers and your sisters, you can call them and talk to them. With a, with a pet, with a cat or a dog, the relationship is so physical. It's, it's so reliant on touch and physical play and companionship in person that when you move away, the relationship ends other than your visits. Anyway, when my cousin's cat passed away, he made a post on Facebook about how all the assholes he worked with were making fun of him. Literally f making fun of somebody whose cat passed away. Telling him like, it's just a cat, it's just an animal. <laughs> like fucking idiots. I'm sorry, <laughs> but like, Indulge me on this one. That is an asshole prick thing to say to somebody. Um, and if, if I had been working in a place where stupid, dumb fucks like that, I'm going to get demonetized on this video, I'm sure. But if, if I had been working in a place where, like, if, if my boss had reacted like that, or if they had sat me down and said, like, how could you have told us it was a family emergency when it was just a cat? That, that would have sucked. I don't think I would have, I don't think I had the mental strength or the emotional support back then to have gotten through something like that. Anyway, I just wanted to give that credit where credit is due. My, my boss at that store, regardless of all of her faults, I'm grateful that she was my boss during that sad time. Anyway, back to the synchronicity of 2009 that catapulted me onto the spiritual journey that my life has become. Um, I quit working at DKNY. Actually, I got fired because I stopped working there while still going into work. I decided no longer to compromise my ethics by selling leather or wool. And as a result, I didn't get any sales and as a result of that of course they had to let me go I mean I, they had a very unproductive staff member coming in collecting paychecks but not doing anything so you know but I got a job at Dragon Space the most awesome place to work D guess what like the lady who owns Dragon Space her name is Jessica and she's a chartered accountant by profession, so like her day job is that she does accounting for, I don't even know who, like some rich corporation. Um, so owning the store Dragon Space, it's not, it's not how she pays her bills, it's like her hobby. So guess what our sales goals were for a day? Nothing. They didn't exist. We didn't have sales goals. So... There was no pressure to sell anything. Um, the store manager at that time, this this amazing woman named Birgit, I asked her once, like, damn, it's really slow today. Like, is Jessica going to be mad at you if we don't sell anything? And she laughed and said, are you kidding? What does she expect us to do? If, if Like, it was a really rainy Vancouver day, so... The majority of, of business on Granville Island comes from tourists who take this little boat called the Aquabus over from Yale Town, which is where all the expensive hotels are. Like most of our business was tourists. Um, so on a really rainy day, 
business would be really slow. Yeah, and, I, and I'll never forget, Birgit just said, like, are you kidding? What do you mean get mad at us? Like, she knows what happens on a rainy day, but, like, at other stores where I worked, rain or shine, like, if, if, if the year before the store had sold, like, five grand worth of stuff, you better be selling six grand because it's progress and we have to beat last year's numbers. Ooh, that horrible, stressful sales goal feeling. If, if you've ever worked retail, I'm sure you can relate. So the, the part of the reason I loved Dragon Space so much was that there was no pressure, there were no sales goals, and Jessica was just a lovely lady to work for. Um, she let us get creative. Um, as far as merchandising goes, there was no cor no corporate standard. Like at, at, of course, DK and Y or any franchise of a major corporation, there's like a a guideline given to each franchise for how they have to dress the mannequins and decorate the windows. So there was no creativity involved. It, it was like a paint by number. Like you do the thing in the place you're told to do the thing. But at Dragon Space, like we, we could have some fun. There were lots of fairy figurines and dragons and Brian Froud books and like my inner nerd loves that, right? Um, so yeah, it was a creative place. And there was a store cat. That this, I, I'm gonna have to make a whole other video about this because he was a cool cat too. Lots of stories. But anyway, yeah, in 2009, I, I finally, I was working at a store I loved with people who I got along with, all of them. There wasn't a single person on staff who I didn't look forward to working with. They were all just wonderful people. Um, and one, one day I got home from work, I, I had broken up with B, very bad then boyfriend. I started renting a room from one of my friends who had this awesome condo. She had this like luxury condo and didn't charge me hardly anything for rent. I would tell you how much I paid for rent, but I would get mad at myself because it's like a third what I pay now for a place that's not even as nice. But yeah, like I, I had this great place to live. I was newly single and loving my freedom and my independence. And my mom called me one evening and she said that she and my Auntie Mary Lynn had gone to Waterton that day and that they had gone into, my God, I'm so bad. I wish I could remember the name of this place. They would both be like, are you kidding? It's blah, 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 blah. Cause they know, they know all the names of all the places in Waterton. And despite my good memory, I'm not so good with, with names and dates and, and like place names. Um, I'm good at the other kind of details anyway. It wasn't the Kilmory Lodge. It wasn't... Okay, forget. I, I'm not going to turn into one of those old ladies who says, now it was on a Tuesday, so it must have been Barbara at the hairdresser. Like, I'm not going to tell you one of those stories. I might ramble, but I, I try to avoid that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to force you to listen to me name all the other places in Waterton in hopes that I'll remember the, the name of this place. But anyway... Um, my mom and my Auntie Mary Lynn went into that store at 111 Waterton Street and Miriam, that Indian lady who had sold me the Iolite pendant, came up to my mom and said, were you here with your daughter, the girl who has that dark brown hair and she's so spiritual and powerful? And my mom was kind of shocked that this lady... In fact, I think this was the very next year. It must have been 2000. Now I am telling you an old lady story. Ha <laughs> ha, sorry. Yeah, it was definitely 2008 when I worked at DKNY when Sneaky passed away. And the very next year, 2009, we hadn't been back since. The next, So I met this lady only once. And the next, day my, the next year, my mom went in without me, with my aunt. And this lady remembered her and said, you were here with your daughter can you pass her a message for me? And that lady wrote a little note for my mom on a piece of paper 
and put a little crystal in with it and said, give this to your daughter when the time is right. And she told my mom, um, there's a lady I know in Vancouver who does tarot card readings and I feel like your daughter should meet her. And I'm sorry, I've stopped drawing for now because it's, I like this drawing, but it's just too hard to draw while telling this specific of a story. So she told my mom, like, I have, I have a friend in Vancouver who reads tarot cards and I have a feeling your daughter should meet her. And my mom was like, how did you know my daughter lives in Vancouver? And then that lady was like, I don't know how I knew that. Like, it was kind of freaking her out too. Like she, she just, she has this intuitive gift that so many of us have where we will say something to somebody else that means a lot more to them than we intend it to. And, and it just happens and it's really cool when it happens. Like sometimes I'll say specific things in a video and somebody else will comment and say, you have no way of knowing this. But this morning I told myself that if I hear this phrase, it's a sign. And so we become the carriers of these messages to each other without even knowing it. Um, so Marion didn't even know I lived in Vancouver, but she told my mom, you know, I, I have a feeling your daughter should meet my friend who reads tarot cards. And of course, my mom didn't write down that tarot reader's name or take a, a contact number or anything. She just called me that night and said, so I saw Marion again in uh, the shop in Waterton and she remembers you. And I have a note to give you. She asked me, do I want to know what's on the note? And I said, no, no, no. Like if she told you, give it to me at the right time, like wait. Um, but she told me how cool it was and, and that there was a tarot reader who I should meet. The very next day I was working at Dragon Space and I saw a lady named Denise who owned a shop called The Tarot Room just around the corner from Dragon Space. And I, I knew who Denise was because she had come into the shop to introduce herself and she offered us each a free um, 15 minute reading to kind of test her out so that we could send customers to her. So I, I had known who she was for about a year but had never really interacted with her. But I saw her outside the shop putting up some flyers on our bulletin board and I just ran outside and I said, excuse me, do you know a lady named Marion who works in Waterton? And she, she looked at me and she said, no, but I've been dreaming about you and I've seen in my dreams that you're gifted as a tarot card reader. Would you like to come read cards in the tarot room? And I was like taken aback because I had always wanted to read tarot cards professionally, but I had never pursued that as a career or even knew where to start. So later that day on my lunch break, I, I went to the tarot room and spoke a little bit with Denise and on the spot, she gave me a key to her store. She told me to come in twice a week. I think it was Mondays and I think it was Sundays and Mondays because that's what she took as her weekend. And she said, like, there, it doesn't pay. It's not like a retail job where you get an hourly rate, but this is how much you charge. Like, there was a set amount. I had to charge 15 minutes. Sorry, 15. A 15 minute reading was $30. 30 minute reading was $50. And a one hour reading was $90. So she told me, this is what you charge. All the money is yours to keep if you earn under 150 in a day, but if you earn over 150, then there was a certain amount I had to pay her for rent. And I'll try to keep that a little, I should leave some mystery to this because she's a business person, probably doesn't want her, her rent rates from a decade ago aired in a video. But anyway, I started going into the tarot room and giving readings twice a week. And holy, was that ever life-changing. In fact, my next video is going to be all about my tarot reading experiences because they were beautiful and life-affirming and unexpected and maybe, I'm not gonna promise anything, but maybe one of my future projects will be to design a, a deck, a 
tarot deck with my kind of art. And when that happens, I will start offering readings again. The, the reason I don't do readings now, people have asked in comments if I would give them a tarot card reading and how much I would charge. I won't give a reading to anybody at this point because there isn't a single tarot deck on the market that I feel comfortable with. Um, back then I would use the Osho Zen Tarot, which is still my favorite. It's, it's visually beautiful. It has a philosophy, like even though Osho uh, is arguably a cult leader, not much better than the one that I used to follow. Some would say, I think he's way better than the fraud who calls himself Nithyananda. But, you know, ev even though Osho had his vices and his downside, Ma Deva Padma, who created the Osho Zen Tarot, still made what I think is the best tarot deck on the market. But, but one of the cards has a picture of Osho, and I do find that a little off-putting because I don't think that there's one spiritual teacher who all encompassingly can lead everyone on their life path. And the deck kind of implies that he is the world teacher, which, I mean, sorry, but no. Um, and there's a card called Schizophrenia that basically when that card comes up in somebody's reading, it means that they're at a moment of uncertainty and they're not taking action in any good direction because they can't make a decision and stick with it. But when people see a card laid out on the table in front of them and it says schizophrenia, they tend to freak out and think that it's a psychological diagnosis and that there's something mentally wrong with them. And I just can't put a client through that. That, that That's too, um, that's too off-putting. And, and just like the standard decks, like the Rider Waite Tarot or any of the other tarot decks based on Rider Waite, there's a card called the devil, and I don't believe in a binary black and white good and evil. And there's also a card called death. And when people see that, they tend to take it literally, even though the death card means that it's a time of transformation. Like this, this experience of life has come to an ending. Anyway, um... The reason I want to make my own tarot deck is that I can redesign those kinds of cards and give them names that I personally resonate with and that I would be comfortable showing to a client and describing to a client without that fear that this is going to mess a person up. And to me, it's not about predicting the future, it's about choosing your own destiny and seeing what kind of a trajectory you're headed on, and then either what to do to keep up with that trajectory or what can be shifted to change it. Um, we have free will, so there is no set in stone, definitely gonna happen future. The, the future is based on the decisions you make and the actions you take now. Manifestation requires no action, um, but manifestation does require mindset, that silence. It, it's only in a space of inner silence that you can choose your destiny. I, I would say the way I believe it, it's like this. If your inner space is so cluttered with fear and anxiety and worry and regret and other people's opinions, then there is such a thing as predestination because you will be moving in the direction the world is pushing you, society is pushing you. But if you achieve a, a meditative space of introspection in which you can analyze your motivations and determine whether you're doing something because it's your natural expression and tendency or whether you're doing it because you feel obligated to or afraid not to or that that you're working for an outcome based on somebody else's expectations the moment you can be in a space of self-analysis to determine whether your course of action is right for you or not it's only in that space of inner silence that you can create your own destiny because you can take a step 
back from yourself. This, this is what the Vedic scriptures or the, the Hindu, the Sanatana Dharma philosophy described in, in the words of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita when he told Arjuna to take actions not for the sake of the outcome but for the action itself that dharma is doing for the sake of doing not doing for the sake of getting something when the doing is done i feel this is what was meant by that that society would tell somebody like me draw a picture go to a publishing house and publish a coloring book sell the rights of that picture to an editor who's going to do with it whatever they want basically draw so that you can sell out and cash in and society would push artists to commercialize their work like that right my inner dharma draws for the sake of expressing my meditative inner space in the form of an image and then after i collected a bunch of images then the idea came to me to self-publish these as a coloring book that people can use to experience that same meditative consciousness it's not that I had a product in mind, right? Sell it as a coloring book and then made the pictures. It's more like the pictures will flow. And once that dance of creation is complete, then a product can be created out of it, right? It, it's like doing not for the sake of the outcome, but the outcome becomes even better when you're doing something not for the outcome. And I know I've talked about this in previous videos regarding my preference for abstract art as opposed to representational art, because with representational art, the art is always created for the sake of the outcome. There, there's a certain message or image you want to depict. And so if the image doesn't look the way you want it to, you feel like it's a failure. Whereas with stream of consciousness drawings like this one with meditative drawings with zen drawings as it's been marketed there's a difference between my style and zen tangles and zen art and I, i'll share that in an upcoming video um but when when we're creating for the sake of creation not creating for the sake of an end result the end result is so much more spontaneous and beautiful and organic and unique. And a really well done tarot reading is like that. The, the charlatans are the readers who read because they want to get paid and who put clients into fear by saying things like, if you don't come back for a reading, something bad will happen to you. Like F that. I used to tell my clients, if I never see you again, I'll know that this was a successful reading because you don't feel the need to get somebody else's opinion about your life again. And I wasn't in it for a commercial greed of let's see how many regulars I can get. And, you know, it, it was more like maybe the messages that come through me can help somebody else do what they love most in life. That's what I was in it for. But anyway, yeah, 2009, the, the synchronicity with Miriam, who worked in 111 Waterton Street. I'll tell you in the video description the actual name of that establishment, and it is killing me. You have no idea how annoyed I am with myself that I don't remember. Bayshore Inn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to... Uh, my my brain for popping the word back into my awareness Bayshore Inn and the Bayshore Inn gift shop is at 111 Waterton Street where this synchronicity took place um it was because of Miriam telling me that there she had a friend in Vancouver who was a tarot card reader that I should meet through my mom it was only because of that that I approached Denise from the tarot room the next day on Granville Island. And if I hadn't gone after her, she might not have known where this girl who she kept seeing in her dream worked. She might not have, you know, found me. So it, it was such a cool synchronicity that got me my position reading cards at the tarot room. 
and it, it's just interesting how I had said to myself early, the year before, whenever I see the number 111, it means I'm in the right place at the right time. And then the Bayshore Inn happened to be 111 Waterton Street, where I got that Iolite, and where Miriam gave me that beautiful tip to talk to a tarot reader in Vancouver that set my life trajectory in a whole new better uplifting spiritual course and it was because of that job and my interactions with Denise the shop owner and a lady named Sabita who is a really cool Buddhist lady from Sri Lanka who taught me all kinds of things about Buddhism and meditation um, and Denise was really cool she had a collection of like over a hundred different tarot decks and she wasn't selfish and secretive about them. She kept all of them in this really cool vintage cabinet in the shop. And she told me that when I'm there, I'm welcome to all of it. She said, you can use my decks, you can read my books, like just make yourself at home. And I mean, some of us wouldn't be so open, right? Like if, if I gave somebody the keys to my apartment, I would probably tell them, um, don't touch my crystals and don't touch my books and don't mess things up not because I'm a bitch and because I, I don't trust people but because I know where I've kept stuff and if even though my, my jewelry desk might look like a chaotic mess to somebody else if I'm sitting there making a, a necklace I can reach into that, that messy pile and know exactly where the clasps are and where the fluorite beads are and where the Herkimer diamonds are like it it's messy but it's my mess so I know where things are and same with my bookshelf and same with my my um corner where I keep all of my art supplies and craft stuff like postcards like it's ah I I'm just amazed to this day by how Denise do you know what else she didn't want a resume from me I asked her if she wanted to make some reference calls before giving the key because all the jobs I'd ever worked at before I had to apply for. And this was something really cool because I asked her, do you want to call some references? Do you want to maybe talk to Birgit or Jessica at Dragon Space before you just give me the key to your shop like this? And she laughed and she said, if I couldn't read your energy and hire you based on that, then what good would I be as a psychic? And that's a pretty cool thing to say, like, right? Props to her. Like, she she could read people, and she just knew. And even though I had literally no experience reading cards professionally, damn, like, she... I, I want to say she took a chance on me, but then again she was just a really good intuitive she knew who she was hiring and she even said that she said you might think i don't know you but i've seen you in my dream i know what you're capable of and that's pretty damn awesome the other thing i want to say because i feel like the story is incomplete if i don't share it the other thing is when i found the fraud who turned out to be a cult leader who i went to india to follow Part of me still believes I was cosmically ordained to go there, maybe to experience the, the ultimate of being brainwashed and controlled by a, a false spiritual authority figure so I could break free from that and, like a rubber band, fly further forward when I come out of it. Part of me thinks I might have been sent into that negative experience on purpose. It's Bashar's rubber band theory, like I've mentioned before. And, and part of me thinks maybe I had to go there because somebody had to expose what they're doing on social media to warn future seekers. I don't think it was just a mistake. I do think in some way or another, it was destined to happen. Because the day, the very day I went, I, I got off the bus and went to that, it was called the Life Bliss Center, the Nityananda Center in Vancouver. Two interesting things happened. One, 
the Life Bliss Center was at 111 West Broadway. So when I went in for that very first meditation, I saw that number 111 and thought I'm in the right place at the right time. But the other thing is when I got home that evening, there was a letter in the mailbox from my mom and it was just a, it was a, a greeting card, but it wasn't like a birthday card or a congratulations card. It was just a beautiful card. And in it, my mom did the sweetest thing. She wrote the alphabet like A to Z because I'm Canadian and it's blasphemy in Canada to, to say Z. We, we speak like the British when it comes to the alphabet. We, we use the letter U in words where you guys just use an O like color. Okay, that, that's probably the worst fake British accent you've ever heard, but yeah. From A to Z, she listed out good qualities that she said were about me. And she said that she sent me that card because she had found in her purse that day the little note that Miriam had written and said, give this to your daughter when the time is right. So when she found it in her purse, she thought, huh, I guess now is the right time. So she wrote me this beautiful little card. She sent it with Miriam's note. I got it in the mail the day I went to that frauds center at 111 West Broadway for the first time. And the note Miriam had written said, Sarah, great things are coming your way. You will be going to India soon. And the word soon was underlined twice, put in all capital letters, and she did an exclamation mark. You will be going to India soon. So that day, I saw discourses from an Indian man who they all said was the enlightened master, and everybody at that meditation told me you should go see him in India. So I get home. I'm already kind of in awe of the fact that his meditation center was 111 West Broadway. But then I get home and there's a letter from this lady in India, from India, who works at 111 Waterton Street saying, Sarah, you will be going to India soon. Like, it doesn't take a genius to figure out why I immediately just trusted him. It, it's not just that I enjoyed his discourses or his meditation. Like, there, there were little synchronicities like that aligning to make me believe it was the right next step in my spiritual journey. And like I said, I, I still kind of think maybe it was meant to happen, but not for the reason I believed at the time, which was that this guru will give me enlightenment, which is what I wanted going in. Um, but maybe for a whole other reason, maybe that fraud guru broke some kind of inner yearning I had for the approval of a spiritual authority figure that might have been planted in me in my Catholic childhood that I maybe I didn't even know it existed. I'm, I'm saying maybe because I don't think that's what it was, but that could be. Regardless of that, I do think there was some kind of a reason that that happened. And this brings me back to the original point of this video, which is that I seem to always be super positive and trust in myself and believe that the, the best thing will happen. And I think this is why there, there's like that, that expression, if life hands you lemons, you make lemonade. Well, if, if life traps you in a cult and you break free from that cult, find the lemonade in that lemon. For me, the lemonade from that lemon is that I am no longer, um, I, I have no, I, I, it's so hard to put this into words. I've never verbalized this before, but it's like now I only trust my personal intuition. I will never do something just because there's an external synchronicity that seems to point in that direction. So as much as I love repeat numbers like 111 and 222 and 333 and 444, I'm not going to gear my life in the direction of following those. I can understand now why superstition can be a dangerous thing. And I still have a huge reverence and love for the Hindu deities. 
but I'm not going to become so OCD about it that I will only do something if it's an auspicious astrological day or if a, a so-called master says do it or don't do it. We are the masters of our own lives and spirituality is discovering that. And if we have to get taken advantage of by a fraud in order to realize we know better for ourselves than anybody else can ever claim to, because one thing that fraud guru always said was, I know you better than you know yourself. And, you know, bullshit, he did not. He just knew how to manipulate us better than we knew how to avoid getting manipulated. Um, but yeah, the, to answer that question of how I can be so, predict so productive and creative and self-confident despite that cult experience, as I said earlier, it didn't happen instantly. It's not like I escaped from that cult and bounced back overnight and started making videos and drawing and making jewelry. Like it, it took a few months before I started making videos and jewelry again. It took even longer before I fully broke free from all the mental manipulations um, and, and was able to throw away like the jewelry that the fraud had given me or the lion stick that he had given me. Like it, it was a journey, it was a process. And I think it's, it's thanks to a few mental strengths that I have accumulated throughout this journey that I was able to make a YouTube video saying flat out, I was brainwashed, like this was a cult and he's doing these bad things. That's not something I would have been able to do at the time when I was still scared people would make fun of my appearance or scared people who disagree would argue with me or scared that I would stumble my words and say the wrong thing. But when I realigned myself once again to doing what I believed in, there was no longer a fear of other people reacting badly to what I did. And so it's, it's like I was saying, back when I worked high-end fashion retail, I wouldn't have been as comfortable speaking on camera because I felt like a hypocrite. The same way when I first escaped from that cult, I felt like a hypocrite because in my mind I had all of these synchronicities that had led me into the cult and I went through this kind of a, an identity trauma where I thought, I mean, Mahavatar Babaji seemed to be leading me to Nityananda and his center was 111 West Broadway, just like 111 Waterton Street and Miriam told me I'd be going to India and this vision and that miracle and this synchronicity it's like i felt like i was disobeying the divine guidance i had been given when i broke out of the cult and so the mental manipulation was also like a spiritual manipulation and yet i've kind of come full circle to think maybe those synchronicities really did happen for a reason and maybe it was beneficial for me to go through that grueling, terrible experience because maybe I really did come out of it stronger. And there are other people who are survivors of the Nityananda cult who have told me that they do feel like in a way that fraud, fake guru did bless them with an enlightening experience. Hear me out on this. I was pissed too when I first heard them say that. But they said that around him, they experienced the epitome of being controlled and mentally enslaved and lied to and forced to see reality through the self-serving agenda of that fraud to such an all-encompassing extent that they forgot who they even were. But that when they broke free of that and got their identity back, it's kind of like you you never think you could survive, you know, a, a deadly car crash. But if you walk out of it, you have a greater appreciation for life because you, you realize what a blessing it is to be alive. It's kind of like when you come out of a controlling 
traumatic cult environment you never take the little things for granted anymore like i i used to take for granted the fact that on my days off i can go wherever i want and do whatever i want in the cult where there were no days off when we were working 18 hours a day and for the six hours we had to wash our clothes and brush our teeth and shower and sleep if we were lucky even during that time we were on call so for example if i worked 18 hours straight in that cult and took a shower and started getting ready for bed my cell phone could ring and i could be getting a call from one of the leads saying you have to come to a meeting immediately and i'd have to get dressed again and do my full makeup because that fraud cult leader gave me a rule that I could never appear in front of him without a full face of makeup and all the jewels of Davy because that was his fantasy of me. So it, it's like when, when I came out of that highly controlled environment, I wake up every morning so grateful that I have my own apartment where I can set my own schedule and drink my coffee for as long as I want to and cuddle with my cats for as long as I want to and, and draw pictures like this while talking about whatever I want to. Nobody else telling me what I have to do. And so I think the, the reason I'm able to be so productive and active about it, despite the cult experience, is that my joy to be myself is even greater now because I know what it feels like to be somebody I don't want to be because an external authority who imposes himself on me tells me to. If, you, if you've never been in a cult, congratulations, don't get into one. But if you don't understand really what I'm describing when I say that we would work, for, for me, the, the position I had there, 18 hours would be minimum. Some days I would work 20 hour days and then have one hour to shower, brush my teeth, wash my clothes you know, two and a half hours to sleep and then a, a half hour to get ready and do my morning rituals before going for session. Like it was intense sleep deprivation. And seven days a week, we had no days off. We had no weekends. It would be six months at a stretch because I would get to come back to Canada to renew my visa. And that was like the only thing close to a vacation that I would get. But even from, from Canada, I would have to do work, transcribe discourses and run events and conduct sessions. So it's, it's not like that was really home free. Um, if you don't know what that would be like, imagine the most stressful job you've ever worked in your life. And then imagine living there. Like, oh, if I think back to when I worked at DKNY, at least that was a billion times better than being in the Nityananda cult because at the end of the eight hour shift, I would get to catch the 99 beeline and go home for the night. And I had two days off every week. But in the cult, there was no going home because the, the, the stressful, high pressure work environment is home. And that's an undescribably bad thing to experience if you're an introvert like me and you kind of need your alone time to recuperate your strength after being public and surrounded by people and, and constantly engaging with others. Imagine you have no personal time, you've got roommates, so there, there's no personal space. You're, you're assigned what to do and when to do it, so there's no choice. Um, some days I didn't eat because I tried to stay vegan even there when I found out the milk was not actually cruelty-free Goshala milk, but they were bringing in outside dairy. So as a vegan, um, I would stockpile, I, I bought myself a, a kettle, like an instant water boiler thing, and I bought some organic oats and a bag of raisins and a bag of walnuts and so there were days that i would make myself oatmeal in my room and that was all i ate for like 24 hours because nothing else available was vegan so it, it was it was really um if i could go back in time and not do it i mean i i'd probably 
choose the easy way and just not do it and just stay at the tarot room and dragon space and make my jewelry and be private. Um, I probably would never have started a YouTube channel if I hadn't gotten into that cult. But anyway, it, it's not that I'm such a great person that my confidence is always high and my self-esteem never crashes and that I'm always creative. It's that I've, I've worked and, and dedicated myself to bouncing back after negative experiences because I have kind of an internal um, barometer, is that the right word for it? I've, I've got like a little internal device that kicks in and it's like an alarm will go off if I'm doing something for the wrong reason, if I ever catch myself doing something because I feel like I have to, you know, other than paying my rent and cleaning the cat litter and doing taxes, like, of course I do those things, not because I love it, but because, you know, I'll lose my apartment and my, 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 my place will smell like pee and poop if I don't do the cat litter. And, you know, I'll, I'll get in trouble if I don't do taxes. Like, of course, of course there are some things we literally have to do because of just the way the world works but if I ever catch myself in a video talking about something that feels inauthentic I'll delete the file and start over luckily that hasn't happened in in at least a year since I fully deprogrammed from the cult and I, I think one way that you can kind of check yourself and see for example, if you feel like your productivity is suffering because of your mental or your physical health, as this comment had, had mentioned, kind of check in and see if there's anything that you're doing in life that you're going through the motions, but it's not authentic to you. And see what small steps you can start to take to elevate yourself out of it. I wish I could say that I quit working the high pressure fashion retail job because it didn't suit me, but in fact, I got fired, as I said, because I just stopped putting in any effort at work. So it's kind of like I had to evolve. And because I lost that job that I didn't resonate with, what what's really amazing, guys, is that about two weeks before they fired me, I handed out resumes to all the places in Vancouver I loved, including Dragon Space, uh, including the Crystal Arc, including Banyan Books, um, the Foundation Restaurant, the Nam Restaurant, like all the vegan restaurants, all the crystal stores. And I didn't have any immediate plans to quit the fashion retail. It was just kind of like, I thought if any of these places offer me an interview, I'll go for the interview. And if they offer me a job, then I'll quit this shit retail work that I'm doing. But like, here's why I kind of feel like I've got a, a very powerful spiritual ally in the, in the ether. Because the day I got fired from DKNY, that same exact day, I got a phone call from Dragon Space offering me a job. So I wasn't out like at all. And, and it's things like that just happened for me. Like my mom used to say, my mom and my aunties used to call it Sarah stories because I'd say, well, this thing happened, but then that thing happened right after. And it, it's kind of like, again, the obligatory Seinfeld <laughs> reference. There's this episode where they talk about even Steven where if they lose something, they'll find another one just like it. And Jerry was even Steven, like he threw a $10 bill out the window and then somebody handed him a $10 bill and like, just just stuff like that. God, I, I could go into another five hour video just about these kinds of synchronicities. But my point is if, if you're working at a job that's not harmonious with you, don't beat yourself up over it. If you don't get home in the evenings and feel the energy to draw a picture or make a YouTube video or write a song or, or do anything else that that is creative or productive like you need your downtime to recover from the emotional exhaustion that takes over 
when you're doing something out of alignment with your being. Making a YouTube video like this one where I'm talking for like two hours straight, it doesn't exhaust me. I still feel high energy afterwards because everything I'm saying is truth to me. Whereas if I had to go into a, a retail store and talk up a product I don't believe in, I would be exhausted after 10 minutes. Because whenever we have to work at something that's not natural, it's work. When we work at something that is natural and fun and intuitive, it's not work. And I'm not saying quit your job and start doing something that doesn't guarantee you income because even I've never been brave enough to do that. But when unharmonious paths that I've been on have come to an ending, it's always given me the opportunity to decide how to change course and what to do next. And I mean, that there's a lot of stuff about this out there from corporate people who lose their job because of downsizing or the economic crash. And then for the very first time, they have no stable income, but they do have the opportunity to reinvent themselves and to decide what to do next. So they'll launch their own companies or um, get into a creative hobby or go back to school for what they really wanted to do. And it, it's like these so-called losses can be huge blessings. I'm glad that I lost that job so I was able to get a better one. And I don't know if I would have appreciated Dragon Space quite as much as I did if I hadn't worked in more competitive, less harmonious positions like the fashion retail one. So yeah, th this video was a little different. Usually I can just draw and talk and the two don't conflict, but I think when I have to talk about something that requires more memory power, when I have to think about what I'm saying, it's harder to draw simultaneously. It's interesting. I'd, I'd be curious to experiment with myself and try different topics and see how fluidly they work. Um, also because on this one I had to really consciously look for the smudges and work them into the picture. But similarly, like I said, that's a good analogy. I'm glad this is the piece I'm drawing for this topic because Working a smudge into a picture in a way that the picture still looks beautiful, sometimes the smudges turn into the, the best part of the picture and the picture wouldn't have been the same without that one more little detail added. And the same way, the smudges on the, the paper that is your life are the experiences you wish hadn't happened or the insecurities that you might be carrying with you. But how you work those into your drawing, that that's how you're able to move past those experiences and take the lessons from them. It's, it's the lemonade that you make out of those lemons. And I feel like there's some kind of a will inside me to make the best out of everything because I would rather be happy and excited and productive and creative then dwell on the past and wallow in my my shame or my embarrassment about the mistakes I've made. I'd rather share those mistakes so that other people can avoid making them than hide in my bubble of anonymity. And I think that's why I made videos exposing the cult and that's why I make videos talking about stuff like this. And I'm just so glad and grateful that you know, some of you are commenting and, and mentioning that it's helpful for you or inspiring for you. Thank you. That, to me, more than anything else, that tells me that all the crap I've dealt with was worth it. If it's able to help other people get through their crap that they've had to deal with. Because we live in a crappy world. End of video. Negative note. No. We, we live in a world that has both positive and negative where sometimes things happen exactly how we want them, and other times things happen in a way that we wouldn't have chosen if we had known going in, that's what it would be. But whether you are in a palace 
or in a shack, or if you fall into a pile of mud while you're walking, if you slip on a rainy day, you are still you. In that palace, you might feel royal and grand because your surroundings are beautiful. And in the shack, you might feel a little dingier because it's not high end. And in that pile of mud, you're gonna feel dirty because you've got dirt all over you. But even if somebody's in the palace, the next day they could get dirty. Even if somebody's in a shack, the next day they could hit it big and buy a palace. Even if you're in the mud, you are not the mud. You're the lotus flower that blooms beautifully despite the muddy water you've grown from. And the moment you take a shower and change your clothes, you're not muddy anymore. So the circumstances you're in do not determine the quality of who you are. It's the quality of who you are that can transform the circumstances. So while one person could be in a cult situation and then get out of it and just give up on life and go on welfare and, you know, hide from the world in shame, no judgment to those who do because I get it. I can see why they would. Somebody else like me will make the decision to move past that experience and to become my authentic self once again. And this reminds me of another beautiful Basharism where he says, circumstances don't matter, only state of being matters. And what he means by that is matter as in materialize and manifest. Your circumstances don't materialize into your life. Your state of being materializes into your life. So your circumstance of being rich or poor, popular or made fun of, um, free thinking or trapped in a cult of, of mind control, it's not that circumstance that, that determines your future. It's the state of being. It's how you choose to experience yourself that determines your future because you create from your inner space, not from your external surroundings. So I think I have talked enough. I'm not going to say babble anymore because your lovely comments, some of your lovely comments have said you like it when I babble. So I'm not going to put myself down and say that I'm nattering on, even though I kind of did. Um, but yeah, I think this video is way longer than I originally planned. Thank you so much for, for the comment that sparked this topic. I think it's something, it's an important discussion to open up. And if you have any feelings about this yourself, experiences you'd like to share similar to what I've shared or totally different than what I've shared, if you agree, if you disagree, if you have a question, just any comment that you might have about this, please leave it in the comments below. Um, I read every single comment on my newest video. Um, I, I can't read every comment on all of them because there's just too many, but as long as this is still the newest video, I will be reading all of the comments on it. And if you're seeing this like a month from now or two months from now and you want to ask about this, just subscribe and wait until I release a new video and then leave your comment under that video because whatever video is my newest at any given time, those are the comments I will be reading and replying to. And I, like I said, I think this is a subject that needs further discussion. So I'm going to start planning out my next few video topics and l let's share on this a bit more because I've, I've had a few other people comment that they missed the videos where I would talk about synchronicities and spirituality and divine experiences. And like I said, I... I felt like a failure because I followed all my intuition and it led me right smack into a cult. But you're totally right in your comment where you say I don't notice my positive qualities or my strengths, like how I was able to bounce back from that. So maybe I should stop trying to hide one aspect of myself and ignore it like it doesn't exist just because I don't understand the bigger picture of how that could have been a good thing in my life. And maybe, maybe we should start examining that a little bit more openly. Uh, and by we, I mean all of us, because I'm sure we all have things in our past that we think were total fuck-ups, that if we, if we contemplate on them a little bit more carefully, we might discover 
how they've strengthened us, how we've moved on from them, how they've enriched our perspective because they make us more relatable to others. Anyway, I'm going to end it now because I could talk for another 10 hours, but my throat is starting to get sore. I can talk forever mentally, but physically I'm going to have to sip some hot tea because it's been a marathon or a therathon as one of you commented. But yeah, that, that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this one. This drawing is far from finished. I'm going to keep working on it, but offline. If you want copies of any of them to print out for free as downloads, I'm putting some of them in my coloring club. I'll put a link to that in the description. This coming Sunday, uh, what month is it now? May 31st, I almost said June because I'm thinking ahead, but no, May 31st, Sunday, I'm having a private Zoom call with all of my patrons on Patreon. And it's not too late if you wanna get in on that. If you decide you'd like to contribute a little something to help me make videos like this possible. Um, I appreciate all the contributions. It means the world to me that there are people who enjoy my videos enough to, you know, to pay a little bit of money to make sure that I can still make, keep making them. I love that. And another way you can really help me out as far as furthering my artistic career and um, especially the coloring book I want to self-publish. I don't want to go with Create Space Print On Demand ever again, which is now the Amazon, what's it called? You know, the e-reader company, Kindle. I don't want to go with Kindle ever again because the quality of paper they use and the blurriness of printing is just subpar and I would feel guilty charging people money for my art if it's not printed to my standards. So the next coloring book that I self-publish, I'm going to do it right and invest in good paper and, you know, a, a properly designed interior. And the funds I'm collecting for that will come from the sales of these postcard prints that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. So I'll put the link to my Etsy shop also in my video description. And yeah. I've said this before, but this time I really mean it. That's it for this video. I'm gonna end it now. Now, much love. See you next time. Thank you for your support. Bye.